is uh, the group there. Yes, Jim, we're all here. Can you see us? We can. Yeah, we're all here. Everybody's here, and we're <coughs> we're raring to go. Excellent. Uh, well, well, welcome everyone, and welcome to the first uh, joint transition resource group meeting for revenue recognition. Uh, the completion of the the revenue recognition standard was really a monumentous uh, occasion, but it doesn't signal or doesn't represent the end. While it's a significant milestone. Uh, for us, certainly it also then is really the beginning for, for many, beginning for those who have to implement uh, the standard, and that's what this uh, group really represents, is it's not the end for us either, while it's a, a significant milestone. We are committed to understanding the transition issues, uh, identifying those issues, uh, determining whether or not something needs to be done on our standpoint. Uh, and really the objective is, um, while we have now a converged standard that will result in the potential for greater comparability, really ensuring that that, that is what in fact happens in the execution on transition. Uh, so that's what we're here for. Uh, this isn't uh, a forum to really re-deliberate or debate the fundamental issues uh, of the standard. Uh, you don't like the answer. Uh, this isn't the forum for that. It's really, uh, can the answer be applied? Can you? Uh, uh, determine what the objective of the standard is with with a degree of consistency that is is reasonable uh, and particularly from the standpoint of uh, information content to investors so that's what the the group is about uh, we welcome you here and, and Ian I'll turn it over to you for any opening remarks yes thank you thank you very much Jim I'm, uh, I'd like to endorse uh, all the things you've said I'd also like to state publicly um, uh, how well we've cooperated and worked together on this particular venture. We're in uncharted waters, and uh, we had to work out between us how this was to run, how we were to meet, how it was to be chaired, who should be on the groups. And I've got to say that <clears throat> the whole thing's been done in a very fine spirit, which I hope will continue to lead us to remain converged, as Jim said, as we go forward. There are uncharted waters. We don't know exactly how this is going to work out at the end of the day. Today will be very interesting. Um, and of course, afterwards, we'll be very happy to take comments from people or suggestions from people on how we might do things differently. If it, um, and um, um, so we're looking forward to it. It's important. This group is important. The process is important. And continual convergence on this topic is also very important. Now, Jim, I think we're going to do introductions as we go around. Um, you'll note there's not as many around the table here as there is over in Norwalk, but the quality here, of course, will make up for the uh, quantity <laughs> over there. So I might, uh, I'm Ian McIntosh, the Vice Chairman of ISB. Next to me is... Uh, Henry Rees, uh, Technical Director here at the, on the ISB staff. Followed by... Raghava Tirumala, Technical Manager at the IASB. Uh, I'm Lee Pillar. I'm here to observe on behalf of IOSCO. Carl. Carl Douglas, Corporate Controller at CCR. Mary. Mary Tokar, member of the ISB. Brian O'Donovan from KPMG. I'm part of the international group of KPMG. I'm happily joined at the hip with my US colleagues on this project. Good. <clears throat> Emmanuel Cordano, Accounting Standards Manager at Sanofi, a French pharmaceutical company listed in the US. Excellent. Andrew. Andrew Buchanan, Global Head of IFRS at BDO. Christoph. Christoph Hutton, uh, Chief Accounting Officer of SAP. Tony. Tony DeBell, a partner in PwC's Global Accounting Consulting Services team. Kazuo Yuasa at uh, Fujitsu Limited, uh, Head of uh, Finance. James Riley, the Group Finance Director of Jardy Matheson. Philippe Danjou, ISB Board Member. All right. I think uh, that's all our group, so back over to you, Jim. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I'm Jim Croker, FASB board member. I'm Sue Cosper, the FASB technical director. I'm Scott Taub, uh, managing director of uh, financial reporting advisors. I'm a consultant on accounting and financial reporting matters. Karen Brooks. I recently retired as Senior Vice President and Controller of Bell Canada, um, continuing to work with them on this implementation of this standard. 
Jeff Rickman, the senior investor liaison at the FASB, and I led the investor outreach during the RevRec project. Uh, Mike Wood, controller at Raytheon. Mark Siegel, FASB. Jennifer Minky Gerard from the Office of the Chief Accountant at the SEC. Hal Schroeder, FASB. Russell Hodge, technical controller at GE. Larry Smith, FASB. John Armour, Managing Director of the Construction and Engineering Group with Mayor Hoffman McCann. Jeff Bryan, Professional Standards Group of Dixon Hughes Goodman, and I'm also a member of the Private Company Council. Uh, Russ Golden, FASB. Uh, Rich Paul, observing on behalf of the uh, AICPA. Uh, Greg Nelson, VP of Accounting Policy and Financial Reporting at IBM Corporation. Tom Lenzmeyer, FASB. Uh, Mark Crowley, Deloitte National Office, uh, Standards and Communications Group. Rita Spitz, William Blair Investment Management. Alan Cohen, Controller, NBC Universal. Uh, Marty Bauman, Chief Auditor and Director of Professional Standards at the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Jay Hansen, Board Member at the PCAOB. Daryl Buck, FASB. Allison Spivey, Partner, Ernst & Young's National Office. Andrew Ouellette, I'm PTA at the FASB. Uh, Scott Muir, FASB staff. Mary Mazzella, FASB staff. Colin Walsh with the FASB staff. I'm the one that's been inundating your mailboxes, so we appreciate your responsiveness to that. <coughs> Thank you, and, and uh, of course, thanks to, to both Henry, Colin, and the staff. They're going to walk us through uh, some of the sort of the, the logistics, what the group is about, what we're here for, how to submit issues, the types of issues you should think of, about is submitting for, for the group. But uh, I think, as, as Ian says, uh, after that, we'll get into the debate, and it really will be sort of uncharted territory. But we will try our best to, to do this as a joint group, uh, recognizing uh, that the discussion may flow better uh, having one uh, group discuss or one location discuss an issue and, and we'll have to just figure out the logistics but when you do uh, want to be recognized turn your tent card on end at least within this group uh, if the dialogue is occurring here and you really want to get in on the other side of the Atlantic uh, signal Ian he'll put his tent card up or he'll raise two hands and likewise we'll do the same and we'll just have to uh, figure out as we go how to best um, position the dialogue. But with that, I'll turn it over. Uh, Colin, is it to you or to Henry? I will start. Henry and I will give a, a brief overview, overview, as Jim mentioned, of <coughs> the objective of the group, how we envision the group will function, um, how stakeholders can submit issues to the group, and then also a few practical things on how we plan to facilitate the meeting. Um, if you're interested in following along, you, sh you should have slides in front of you um, if you'd like to look at them while Henry and I give the overview. One important note, as Ian mentioned, is that we do plan and we hope that we'll learn from this first meeting um, and we'll make improvements to the group as we progress uh, in response to what we learned. Um, and after this meeting, we certainly welcome your feedback on how the meeting went and any ideas that you have uh, for us to make the group uh, more efficient uh, and effective. So on the, on the first slide, in, in terms of the objective of the group, uh, the boards clearly recognize that the new revenue standard is a significant piece of guidance, and they want to be as helpful as possible to stakeholders um, during this implementation cycle of the project. And so we formed this <coughs> transition resource group um, with an objective of discussing implementation questions that stakeholders raise to the group, uh, and also to inform the boards about potential implementation issues um, on a real-time basis. Uh, we also hope that one of the benefits of this group is that all of you will help to educate stakeholders broadly about the new revenue guidance and help people to start to think about what the implementation means for their organizations. This group itself will not issue guidance. Um, however, it will be instrumental in informing all the board members about whether any action is necessary associated with the implementation issues uh, that stakeholders raise. If you move to the next slide, any stakeholder is welcome to submit an issue to this group. We will read all of the submissions 
evaluate them and prioritize them for discussion um, at a transition group meeting. In some cases, the staff thinks we'll end up grouping a number of issues that have um, similar types of questions or related questions. Um, also, in some cases, we think it's possible that submissions will be narrow or the question will be clear in the guidance. And in those cases, we may just pick up the phone and, and see if we can be helpful to that stakeholder and point them to specific uh, paragraphs within the guidance. Issues that are going to be discussed by this group uh, will be discussed in public meetings, much like the one today. Um, and after the meeting occurs, uh, the boards will decide what action they think is necessary associated with uh, the implementation questions that are raised. Um, in some cases, the boards may decide that the dialogue and the education that occurred at the meeting is sufficient. Um, in other cases, the boards may think that stakeholders would benefit from some additional education. And so the staff may hold webcasts, for example, um, to discuss implementation issues that arise. And then hopefully in, in limited circumstances, uh, the boards may decide that they should improve some of the words in, in the standard that was issued um, to make their intentions clearer based on the feedback that has received. This wrap-up phase will be transparent. Stakeholders will know what the board's plan is for each of the items that are discussed at transition meetings. And that includes items where the boards decide that they do not think they'll take any action. And we will communicate that to, uh, to stakeholders broadly. As, I, as you can tell from the introductions that we had in London and, and Norwalk, uh, we think the members of this group represent a, a very informed and diverse set of stakeholders, uh, including preparers, users, auditors, and practitioners that will be involved with implementation. Uh, we tried to select members that represented a wide spectrum of industries, geographies, and private and public uh, organizations that will be involved with implementation. Henry, do you want to discuss the last couple of slides? Yes, thanks, Cullen. So moving on to uh, slide four, um, I'm sure you're aware and may well have looked at it, but we have now got our respective websites for this group up and running on our uh, ISD and FASB website. So effectively, any stakeholder, as Cullen was saying, can submit an issue uh, to us uh, by downloading what is a common submission form and uh, sending it through to us. We are trying to, uh, if you look on the website, we are trying to manage sort of stakeholder expectations a little bit and sort of trying to make it clear this isn't a, a sort of a technical helpline service on a particular issue or the, on one of their particular contracts. So we have sort of specified some criteria on the website and very much asking people to think about why um, the issue that they're confronted with is one where they think essentially, you know, people could read the word in a different way and it could lead to sort of diversity in practice. And then the other thing we ask people to think about is, is, is just how pervasive do they think this issue will be and will affect a number of stakeholders. So some criteria around the submissions. And as Cullen says, you know, we're going to consider all of these issues uh, that come in um, we won't actually make the submission forms themselves public, um, but obviously then once we've decided how they're going to come to the group and whether they're going to be um, perhaps compiled with other issues, obviously that all then becomes into the public domain. Um, I, what we will probably do is, is we'll develop a, some sort of a summary report of the issues and create a sort of status report or a log of the issues. So this group can see the sort of the pipeline, um, the prioritization and the actions on the particular issues that have been submitted. And I envisage that that sort of log or status report will become a sort of standing item on our future agendas. The sort of plan, the current plan for this group is that it's limited life and obviously that it's going to exist through the implementation period. But certainly when I'm talking about it, and I know Cullen is doing the same, when we're talking about the group to external stakeholders, we are trying to convey a message of that we would like the, the balance of this group's work to be perhaps earlier in the implementation period rather than later. So we are encouraging people to try and get their submissions in um, as soon as possible. 
Moving on to uh, slide five, um, obviously we've decided to hold the meetings jointly in the FA's offices and our offices. We've done this for some other working groups that we've had, um, and obviously we've done it with joint board meetings, so we hope it's going to work well. Um, I think we have mentioned this previously, but just to sort of emphasise that you're very free to attend in whichever is the most convenient location. So, for example, if some US colleagues happen to be you know, visiting perhaps subsidiaries or whatever in Europe around the time of the meeting, then you know, feel free to join us here at the ISB and obviously vice versa. Today's meeting is relatively short, um, but we expect that's the only time this is going to happen and we do expect <laughs> that we will have uh, fuller agendas going forward. Um, and as I think Cullen and I have indicated in our emails to you, that is going to probably just require a little bit of flexibility uh, to make this work. So unfortunately for colleagues in the US, that's going to mean starting earlier than usual, perhaps 7 a.m. And for us here in London, working till later between perhaps 7 and 8 p.m. Clearly, um, as Cullen and Jim and Ian have said so far, we really want to hear your views and advice um, on the issues that have been discussed at this meeting. So we're really hoping that there'll be a, a really good interaction um, between members of the group. Um, obviously, it's a little bit more challenging being in the two different locations. But as Ian indicated, you know, I think we can manage this by if the discussion starts off in Norwalk um, and somebody here really wants to get in on the discussion, if you raise your tent card, then you're trying to indicate to Norwalk that we want to get in and vice versa. Um, similarly, if we're just doing this, we've started the discussion here in London, you put your cards up, um, but you want to sort of get in, you feel um, you want to contribute to the point that's just been made, perhaps if you sort of just raise your hand and indicate to the, uh, to the chairman. So we'll see how that works. We've got one uh, meeting in the calendar already for the 31st of October. We have now identified um, four dates for next year and we will circulate that by email to you immediately um, after this meeting. <laughs> Lastly, just on slide six is just to uh, just a reminder about all of the information that's on our <clears throat> respective um, websites. Um, it would be a really good resource of information there, but all of the uh, materials of the meeting are up on the website. So that does mean that people who are listening in to the discussion today and future meetings can actually look at the uh, agenda, agenda papers. So I think that's all we wanted to say. I think um, obviously Cullen and I are very happy to take any questions. Any questions of anybody here on what's been said? <coughs> Any comments, Philippe? Uh, maybe not a question, but maybe an additional comment. Uh, we, we have been unable to, to uh, have everyone being represented on this group, obviously. Uh, so some people in various industries uh, may wish to contact their peers on this group in the same industry to have some preliminary discussions before an issue is tabled or addressed to the uh, staff here. So. Uh, don't be too surprised if, because your name is public, if you are uh, in touch with some colleagues in your industries who want to raise some issues with you and have some preliminary exchange before they come to this group. Okay. I think that's it here, Jim. We've um, worked out between us that <clears throat> either Jim or I will sort of be the senior chair for each subject. So Jim's going to do numbers one and two, and I'm going to do numbers three and four. So I think we'll hand over to you and Nor now, Jim, to uh, to move forward. Excellent. To the, on to the the fun part of the day. Uh, the, the first issue is an issue uh, dealing with gross versus net revenue reporting. Uh, seems a little bit like deja vu to me. I, I remember dealing with this issue around this same table uh, in the late 90s, uh, but transactions have evolved since then and obviously with a new revenue recognition standard as well. I think there are uh, 
as the paper outlines, some questions in practice um, that certainly bear a consideration by, by this group and, and input that we can benefit from as, as a collective group of boards. Uh, Mary Mozilla is going to walk us through that issue, and I'll turn it over to you, Mary. Thanks, Jim. Some stakeholders have informed the staff that there may be multiple interpretations of the application of the guidance in the new revenue standard about determining and accounting for whether an entity is a principal or an agent to contracts for certain intangible goods and services. Under the new revenue sorry, standard... Sorry, Jim. Um, could you just move the microphone a little bit closer because you come and go? Yeah, that's better. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Under the new revenue standard, an entity is the principal to the transaction if the nature of its promise is to provide specified goods or services to a customer. An entity would be the agent to a transaction if the nature of its promise is to arrange for another party to provide those specified, good and, specified goods and services. An entity is a principal if it controls a promised good or service before the entity transfers the good or service to the customer. The standard also includes a list of indicators that an entity is an agent to the transaction. When an entity that is a principal satisfies its performance obligation, they recognize revenue in the gross amount of consideration which it expects to be entitled in exchange of those goods or services, that is, gross revenue. When an entity that is an agent satisfies a performance obligation, they recognize revenue in the amount of the fee or commission which they expect to be entitled for, for, for arranging the other party to provide the goods or services, that is, net revenue. Implementation questions have primarily related to how to interpret the guidance for services or intangible items because it may be more difficult in those circumstances to determine who has control in those types of transactions. For example, recently there's been an emergence of new types of intangible or virtual goods and service arrangements through the use of the internet, including social networking and mobile app stores. For these new type of arrangements, for example, online gaming, there may be diversity in how entities determine if they are the principal of the transaction or the agent, and therefore whether they recognize revenue gross or net. Stakeholders have, have reported to us that the determination becomes difficult in circumstances where the good or service received by the customer is a non-physical item, the cash received by the originator is a net amount of an amount is net of an amount retained by the intermediary. intermediary Oftentimes, it's the party on the front end of the transaction that has the difficulty in making the principal agent determination. And it may not always be apparent who the customer is in the transaction. For example, whether the originator's customer is the intermediary or if their customer is the end customer. Stakeholders have reported three potential implementations in this area. The first issue is how should the agency indicators in the new standard be applied to contracts involving certain intangible goods or services? The second issue is if the entity determines it is the principal, which typically results in gross revenue, what amount of revenue should they recognize if they received a net amount of cash and do not know the gross amount? And the third issue is how should the transaction price allocation guidance be applied to a transaction in which the entity is principal for some of the deliverables and agent for others? The FASB and the ISB would like TRG members' input on your views about the potential implementation issues whether you're aware of other interpretations for any of the issues, and whether there are any related potential interpretation issues that the group should consider. So that, I think, the idea, Mary, you want the group to start with the, the first issue, the interaction of the indicators, principal versus agent, particularly with respect to the emerging types of transactions that are teed up in the, in the paper. Anyone? Perspectives? Is this an issue that we... Yes, Alan. Yeah, could, could you, uh, I guess, inform us what current practice is under current guidance and how maybe current guidance indicators might differ from where the, or the, uh, the revised guidance would potentially take us? Sure. So the current guidance includes a list of indicators that you look at to determine whether you're the principal or agent of the transaction. In the new standard, the guidance is changed in that there's, a, there's an overriding principle of first determining who controls the transaction. And then if you're not sure who has control, you look to the agency indicators to determine um, you know, if you're principal or agent. So it's, some of the indicators are similar to what was there in the past, but the difference is the overlaying concept of control and the interaction of how the indicators work with that. And, and so if you don't know who controls, do you go to those indicators then to determine 
who controls? Is that? Well, that's that's one of the questions we have is, um, you know, there's two different views. One is that you determine who controls. If you're not sure, then you go to the indicators. Another view is that the indicators and the control principle work together and that they're both helping you determine, that the indicators are helping you determine who controls. Okay. And do you know what current practice is right now? What people, what companies are, are doing? In terms of, so in, currently there's no control principle, it's just the indicators. Um, there's certain weighting of indicators today in practice. Um, so that's another question that, that we have um, in terms of does the standard, the new standard, weight the indicators equally or are some more important than others? So we've so I, think, we've I think with respect to some of the developing types of transactions, we were aware that even prior to the finalization of the new standard, there were some questions in practice as to applying the existing factors. So there may have been some degree of um, either diversity or um, one could say maybe reasonable judgment in applying those factors that might result in different outcomes under existing. Scott? I going to touch on a, a couple of the same things. I think Mary sort of gave away uh, perhaps her bias there when she first described uh, if you have control, then it's gross if you don't go to the indicators. So that would be, that. that's certainly one way, one way to handle it, to paraphrase the way that would be interpreted in, under current U.S. gap. Uh, that would suggest that what we now think of as the general inventory risk indicator is determinative under the new standard. I don't know if it was meant to be. I'm not, I, I can read it both ways. One, to say, if you figure out control, you're done. If you don't, go to the indicators. And the other to say, actually, you use the indicators to figure out whether you have control or not. And I, to me, that's if I look at the words of the new standard, I think that's, that's the real question. Do you look at these indicators to decide whether you have control? Or do you look at these indicators if you can't otherwise figure out whether you have control? Realistically, I'm not sure you're going to get a different answer too often, depending upon which way you do this. Uh, I would say <clears throat> I, I, I get questions on gross versus net all the time. Um, it is largely the intangible virtual goods uh, that are generating the issues now, as well as some services. But the questions come on things that happen very quickly. I mean, we're talking in many cases, internet goods or services transaction where every party does whatever it is they do within a half a second. You know, it, it, it all happens at the same time. And I, I think that makes it very hard under the current guidance and it ain't going to get any easier on the new guidance. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that these questions are coming up because of the new standard, though. They, they, they exist today, uh, and, and they're very, uh, very difficult uh, to deal with today. Uh, w one other thing that I note from reading the paper and also from, from Mary's introduction, uh, when I think about the originator of these transactions, you know, the, the party uh, that has the good or service to begin with, and we're trying to figure out whether that party's customer is the intermediary or is the end customer, I usually think about that a little bit different. I say that that party is definitely a principal, is definitely going to recognize revenue gross. It's just a matter of whether their customer is the intermediary or the end. I find that to be a different question, not necessarily an easier one, because i got to figure out how much the gross revenue is. But that's a different question than the than when the intermediary is making the call because the, the, uh, the originator is definitely going to recognize revenue for the sale of the good or service. The question is whether the intermediary's customer is the end customer, or excuse me, the, the originator's customer is the end customer and the intermediary is working for the originator or whether the originator's customer is the intermediary and the intermediary is working for the end customer. So I, I think it's a, it's a little bit different question, and what you may be grossing up uh, for the originator is the cost of buying the intermediary's service uh, or not. So it's a slightly different question. And I think if it 
if it does get to the point of uh, guidance or more discussion, we might need to discuss those issues separately. Scott, from your from your experience, is is the difficult in terms of the indicators? Is the difficulty mainly that some of these newer types of transactions don't fit well with the indicators, or that the indicators provide you know conflicting answers on gross net or or both? I, I think it it is both. I mean, for example, when we talk about control of the good or service, that's the you know that's a key principle today in a current gap with general inventory and primary obligor, and it's key in the new standard as well. Um, when you're talking about internet advertising, right, where you know the ad is going to run on a on a website, so they're the originator. It goes through. Uh, Google ads, it perhaps goes through an agency, and then finally you have the purchaser of the advertiser at the end of this. Well, it all happens literally in milliseconds. Why do I ever care who controls that thing? I mean, it, it starts with the website. Within 10 milliseconds, somebody has bought the right to put their ad on that website, and I'm going to try to figure out whether any of the three or four parties in the middle ever controlled it, um, that's really, really hard. So I, I just think, you know, in that case, I understand the focus on control. I mean, from a conceptual level, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. But it's almost irrelevant in that kind of transaction whether the people in the middle could ever be thought to control anything because it's passing through all of those parties like that. Uh, so, I, you know, I think in those kinds of transactions, focusing on control is never going to give you a satisfactory answer. So then we need to move to the other indicators. Uh, and, you know, there I think then you wind up with, with issues of if you've ever looked at any of these contracts uh, for the intermediary parties, it's pretty hard to figure out who they think their customers are. Um, and I think in large part they, they think that the parties all through the chain are benefiting from their services, and sometimes they have contracts with parties all through the chain that aren't clear as to who's buying what from whom. So it, it is hard to figure out the nature of the promise. And that's just a business issue, not, a, not an issue of the standard. Um, this is Mark Crowley with Deloitte. Um, I, I, I agree with Scott. I, I, I think the question that you, you, I, we tend to jump to is sort of who is the customer that we're, we're dealing with. And um, if I sell something through an intermediary and I have a contract with that intermediary that I'm going to get paid X amount every time they sell virtual coins or a gift card or whatever it is, um, a lot of folks will jump and say, well, my contract is with that, that intermediary and that's my customer. So I'm trying to d figure out Am I going to recognize the fixed amount I'm getting as gross or net? And generally, you, you get to gross. I guess when you look at it through the eyes of, you know, what is the good or service, the service that you're providing, if I'm hosting a website that's going to use the coins or I'm providing a service that a gift card is going to be used on, well, I'm always going to be the one providing that hosting. It's, am I providing it to the intermediary for whoever they designate it to, if they sell it to someone, or... In fact, sometimes they can just give them away as marketing type um, things. You know, come to my website and I'll give you free coins. But I'm certainly not going to record zero revenue in that transaction. It doesn't seem to make sense just because they gave it away. So we, you know, I, I understand the concept of looking at, you know, the good or service and who controls it. But like Scott was saying, it's a lot of times it's instantaneous. Well, I'm not going to, the intermediary is not going to buy the coins until they know they have someone that they're going to sell them to. And then they just sort of go through Immediate, immediately. So then when you look at these indicators, and Colin, I think it's a little bit what your question, I think you get conflicting answers when you look at these. And I can read, you know, A to B, I'm the primary responsible. I can, you know, inventory risk is sort of a mute point. There's no inventory here. It's a virtual type good. I mean, I, uh, and then, you know, establishing prices and the economics really are what, what I would focus on. And who has the discretion? If the customer can take them and give them away for free, discount them to 50 percent or and no matter what they're going to pay you a fixed amount it seems like the economics should play into it too so i think the indicators when you look at these 
you could clearly get to two different answers for very similar transactions. So I think it's uh, something that if, if you want it to, a, a service is almost always going to be your fulfilling it. So when you look at it at a service, if you say who controls that service before it goes to the ultimate customer, wherever it is, it seems like that would always put you in a gross position if you're the, the, the entity providing it through the intermediary. But if, if that's what the, the, the goal is of this standard, then maybe it should just be pointed out. But when you get to these indicators, you could clearly meet one, two, or three of them and you know point yourself towards gross or net in either case. And I think you get conflicting answers a lot of times. And then obviously subject to second guessing by anyone that comes in and checks you afterwards. Yeah, and Mark, you said, you said something interesting there that you know obviously inventor the inventory indicator wouldn't apply. And that's one of the questions um, you know, we had in the paper and that there's two views that it may or may not apply in that circumstance. Do you think about the inventory indicator as just tangible inventory or in the gaming circumstance, do you think about, well, they've got to maintain the hosting and they've got capitalized software and all these other assets that are at risk, you know, should people take a broader view of inventory or do should it just be applied to tangible inventory? Right. I yeah, I, I think if you're if you're looking at these transactions, I'm the entity providing it to the intermediary and the intermediary is selling it. I'm always, in my mind, going to be, I'm the one providing the service. I'm the hosting or whatever it, it's, it's going to be. That question becomes more, who's my customer? If I sell a gift card through a, a retailer um, to come to my pizza shop to, to buy pizza, well, I'm... You know, obviously, I'm the primary obligor. I'm the one. I'm going to record something gross. The question is, am I going to record gross what I get from the retailer, which is a fixed price, or do I have to somehow figure out what the retailer is selling it for? They could call it a lost leader. Come in and spend a hundred dollars, and you get a free gift card. Well, you know, or I can, or they could say they could sell it for face value, or they could sell it for something less than face value. In my mind, I'm. We, you look at it, you can say, well, the customer is the retailer, and I'm just going to provide the service to whoever they designate is, is going to get it and whoever they sell it to, and it sort of transfers. But I understand the other side where a lot of folks will say, no, you're the, you're the primary obligor in that arrangement. You should record it gross, and there can only be one agent and one principal, and that, if, if the other party is the agent, then somehow you have to have a commission expense. Uh, if I could just jump in real quick. I, something you said uh, almost seemed to dovetail off of what Scott said, and I might be interested to hear you either follow up on it or somebody else in the group. You almost seemed to indicate that one of the things that might indicate who the customer is is who controls the economics of the transaction, meaning that uh, you brought up a couple times the, uh, the notion of a loss leader, that uh, the intermediary may decide that I'm go even though I'm going to pay you $3, I'm willing to sell it on to an end customer at zero or a dollar, and in that type of scenario, control of the economics of the transaction might uh, might be something to think about in terms of control or in terms of uh, the notion of who, does that help you determine who the customer is of the original party? And I just wanted to see, was I somewhat hearing a point you were hitting on correctly and see if anybody else picked up on, on that? That, 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 yeah, you hear, heard the point right. I mean, that's, we've, we've thought about that now. Would, and if you look at these indicators, you can say, well, they're not weighted. So, um, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm fulfilling it or, or you know, the, I look at the pricing and I could say maybe there are two principles in some of these transactions where I'm the principal to the, the intermediary and the intermediary is selling it to um, whoever they want or giving it away and they're the principal in that transaction. Not very unsimilar to if I'm a manufacturer and I sell something to a retail store, and then the retail store sells it on to the end customer. There's two principles in that transaction. They're both recording it gross. And I don't think that's um, – that could be happening if the economics in the arrangement are such that they have the, the ability the, – the pricing in that case would be something that I would look to uh, more strongly than I would say whether the good or service is um, control transfers. Allison. Uh, Jim, could I ask a question of Mark, sure, please? Sure, and then please go ahead. I, I just have a question on his use of the word gross. He keeps saying that it's going to be recognised gross, but we've got, you know, we've got the originator and we've got the intermediary and we've got the final customer. Does he mean gross to the final customer, or, or how's he using that word? I didn't quite understand. Uh, that's the question. You got if, and that's what Scott was talking about. If the customer is my intermediate, the gross amount is what I'm getting from the intermediary. 
if somehow I have to say gross is the end customer that happens to be coming into my store or coming in into hosting, then somehow you'd have to figure out what the e intermediary sold it for. Um, if it's very clear, maybe maybe it is gross to the end customer. If it's a very clear agency relationship where you're getting a fixed amount, fixed or the intermediary is getting a fixed amount or a fixed uh, type of commission, but to the extent they have all the pricing and economic risk of what, what they're uh, what they're selling it for, they could sell it for whatever they want. I think you might look at the intermediary as your customer. So it depends on who your customer is. Did, did that answer your question, Ian? I, I think in a, in a simple ex yes yes that that was fine thanks Jim okay <laughs> not great. Awesome. just fine thanks so so just reacting a little bit to some of the dialogue and a couple of other points on your point about who controls the economics when I think about that I think about pricing risk and I know that in some fact patterns that we have addressed the pricing risk sometimes does become determinative when we think of apps and you have companies that develop apps you have companies that host the apps on their platform, sometimes determining which entity controls the pricing risk has, in some instances, been determinative for purposes of the accounting conclusion for whether you have gross versus net. If the intermediary is controlling the pricing of the app and what that price is set at, then the intermediary might be recording the revenue gross versus if it's the developer that's setting the pricing risk or setting the price that that might um, indicate that the d developer should be recording revenue on a gross basis. You know, it's interesting when talking about pricing risk, I noticed one of the fact patterns that's written up here, kind of described in paragraph 21, the one about the virtual goods example. It was a little bit interesting as we were debating this issue. It, it, it's, it's different than fact patterns that we're familiar with. It it's it kind of describes that the intermediary is the one that's setting the price. And in our experience, that, that typically isn't the case. The developer of the game is typically setting the price of whatever it is that they're providing in terms of the good or service, but then the intermediary may be running promotional type specials or something that would allow somebody to access something within a game at a price different than what the developers actually set the price at. And I think in those instances, there typically has not been a debate about pricing risk in terms of the intermediary. The intermediary is really just running a promotion. And so ultimately, that the price that the developer sets for the, the game or whatever it is ultimately ends up being the revenue that's recognized. And the viewpoint there is that primary obligor ends up being the determining factor. That inventory risk, I think a lot of companies for intangible goods and services don't, don't think about inventory risk. Although some recent dialogue related to internet advertising has caused some entities to, to pause a little bit and think about that a little bit more. But to this point, um, it's really primary obligor in those situations um, in determining you who should record the who should be recording the revenue for this, and um, you know I don't know if we're going to get a little bit further on in the discussion about in issue two which view you would take views A through D, but I think um, you know oftentimes today even if an end customer might be paying a price that's different than what the developer sets as the price because the intermediary is running a special or, or some sort of a promotion. Um, the question of, well, should the, should the developer then, because they don't know the price that the end consumer is ultimately paying, should they have to be forced to estimate that? In my, our experience um, in practice today is that entities are not doing those estimates. So I think that that would probably push you closer towards, if, if you're looking at views A, B, C, and D, closer to a view D. That's issue two. Larry Smith. Yes, Scott, you indicated that you get these questions frequently, <clears throat> and I'm assuming you're getting those questions under current GAAP. Um, I, I guess my question is twofold. A, do you find that you're able to answer the question to your satisfaction under current GAAP? And B, do you think the guidance in the new revenue recognition standard <clears throat> is um, significantly different from current gap to cause you to believe that the new standard would not allow you to answer the question assuming you feel comfortable with your answers under current gap no and no thanks for your help <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm here <laughs> Tom I'd like a little better insight into why there is confusion once you think about who the customer is and the contract with the customer. Uh, is it because they're implied contracts? It just seems that if the originator 
is going to be sending something to the intermediary, there would be an explicit contract or an implied contract between the two that would not just specify what needs to be transferred, but what the price would be between for that transfer. And it would seem the confusion would, should arise or only arise if there were contracts between the inter originator and the intermediary and the originator and the end customer that would have pricing terms that would potentially be gross in both places. Because if what I'm doing is eventually having the end customer be my customer in an explicit or implied contract, it would seem that the contract with the, the intermediary would be a net commission-based contract rather than as, as a delivery device rather than grow. So it, it, I would like better insight into the confusion if we start first con concentrating on the contract rather than control and or the indicators. I, Tom, I guess that was probably directed at me um, or both of us. I guess if you just think about a, a, a simple transaction where, um, like, take a gift card and you go into a Costco here and you can buy a, a gift card to buy get a hundred dollars uh, at Morton's, I guess, you can buy that for eighty dollars, and Morton sells it to Costco for for seventy. They don't activate the card until it actually sells. The question becomes: Morton's is getting seventy, or whoever the restaurant mm -hmm. is is getting seventy dollars. From Costco, Costco's transferring that right to go into that restaurant to, to one of their customers. They could sell it at 80, they could sell it at 90, they could sell it at 100, they could give it away for free, they could sell it, they could combine it with other discounts, they could do whatever they want with it. But no matter what, I'm going to get $70 as the, the restaurant. So if you if you say that the transaction is between the ultimate customer that's coming in, because I'm I'm going to provide the service to Costco's customer. If you say that that's the the the, the, the uh, that they're an agent and I'm the principal, there's some that would argue that you have to record whatever Costco gets for that that gift card, not you're the seventy dollars. You're the restaurant. Because you're, you're if you're gross and and you say Costco's the agent, then they're getting an agency fee and you're 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 the gross. They're just acting as your agent. But I would say that your customer is Costco and that you're providing a service to Costco for whoever they designate to come in. Why? I'm not in the... What is the other side to that argument? That, that right. seems right to me. What is the other the side? Primary the primary other side to that argument is that the restaurant is the one that's actually providing the meal or whatever it is to the end customer and that that is the good or service that the end customer ultimately wants. And so the, that's the price, that's the revenue that the, the restaurant should be earning. It, yes, so the primary obligor. But how would the restaurant example, know what Costco sold it for? It you may or may not. They don't. That's yeah, issue two. Sometimes you don't. So if you that's don't know two. what they sold it for, how could you recognize revenue Go find that out. amount? Mark's done. But, well, there, but isn't that an indicator that maybe that's yeah, not the I, right number? In, in, I mean, that, in that question, yes. I would have answered very quickly the same way. Yes. The restaurant's customer is Costco. I, I have less trouble figuring out these answers from the standpoint of the originator than I do from the standpoint of the intermediary right. in many transactions. So... Costco is probably the principal in the transaction with me, but some might say maybe not. Costco doesn't pay for the gift card until they sell it on, and Costco never has to deliver any food. So maybe Costco ought to be net and only recognize their margin as revenue. Harder, however, to get back to Tom's question and I'm going to go back to Internet advertising uh, only because I've had like nine questions on this in the last six months. I've run into situations where the intermediary that I would describe as a matchmaker, except that that sort of is pejorative as to what you think the answer might be, um, but the, the intermediary has a contract with an ad agency the ad agency then has a contract with actual advertisers, but the intermediary has a contract with the ad agency and a contract with the website that has space to sell. 
The website has no contract with an ad agency and has no contract with an advertiser. Yet, it is absolutely clear from the contracts that what intermediary does is match them. So now you, you, you look at it and you say, well, the, the website is selling advertising space to someone. The only party they have a contract with is the intermediary, but that contract doesn't even say they're selling ad space. And for the intermediary, they have no contract that says they're ever buying ad space, so how could they be selling it? So yet you're in a situation where if you look at those three parties, the only party that the website, the originator, has a contract with is the intermediary, so it seems like that's the only party that could be their customer, <clears throat> except that that contract doesn't involve selling ad space at all. Then you can get to your implied contract, Tom, but boy, it's really hard to make a decision as to who is the oblig obligor and what the promise is based on an implied contract. I can tell you that that doesn't go over well with regulators a lot of times. Ian, I, I see your tense up, and let's yes. turn the discussion over to, to the folks in London. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Christoph had a question. I, I've got to admit I struggle with the idea of an implied contract, in particular combined with the idea that I don't know what the end customer is paying. Because I would assume that even an implied contract would need to meet the definition of a contract under the standard. One of the criteria of uh, the definition is that the entity can identify the payment terms for the goods or services to be transferred. If I don't even know how much the customer is paying, I certainly don't know the payment terms. So how could I get to an implied contract? Okay. Any other comments at the... Uh at the London end. Brian. So, a few general observations, um, perhaps a frame comment. Uh, it seems to me that the question, both for the originator and the intermediary, is really about what's the nature of the promise. And that's where I would always start. And I think different originators and different intermediaries make different promises. Um, and I would need to understand the promise in as much detail as possible. And because people make different types of promises, perhaps I'll get to different answers in different cases. And the fact that I'm getting to different answers in different cases doesn't, doesn't trouble me. Um, the issue is obviously where's the dividing line? What's the gray area? Um, there have been a few comments about the position of the originator. Um, I would think that the originator was always a principle, and the question is, um, what is the originator's promise? And that's, that's the answer to the, well, that's the way I would approach the originator question. Um, for the intermediary, I'm looking at the nature of the promise. I'm trying to tell, in the first instance, whether it's clear that they have control more than momentarily. And perhaps in some of these particular types of fact patterns, this is going to be when control is only momentarily. There are references to milliseconds. So perhaps the answer is not going to be obvious. Um, I then look at the indicators to inform my assessment again, but it's an overall assessment. And I don't think the indicators can take me to a place that would absolutely contradict where I would have gotten to if all I had was control. I consider them together to try and make an overall assessment. Uh, there were comments about um, there's no weighting of the indicators, and I can't see um, a weighting of the indicators. I'm used to having an indicator approach under current IFRS, and I can see I have an indicator approach under this new standard. But what I found in practice applying these indicators is that some are more important in some circumstances than others. I can't see an implicit inherent hierarchy of the indicators that exists independently of the facts and circumstances. Uh, there were references to surely the economics of the arrangement need to come in, and perhaps one of the ways they come in is they help you decide 
which are the more important indicators in a given fact pattern. Um, so, so I think what I was hearing in the early part of the discussion was that there was something inherently kind of worrying or disturbing about the fact that it was sometimes difficult to assess control or that indicators might point in different ways. Um, I, I'm not sure that I see such a big inherent problem um, because I can see how I will wrap everything up together with the goal of reaching an overall assessment. Okay, thank you. Tony. Yeah, I think um, like others have said, and there's always going to be an element of judgment um, around this decision, and I don't think that's going to change at all under the new standard. I think it's, it's inherently difficult in some of these transactions when, as Scott said, they all happen instantaneously to, um, to determine who might be the customer, whether or not there's control, um, and so on. And like others have said, I think used to working with a, um, a framework of indicators under the existing standard. Where I think there's perhaps an element of extra tension that's been created by the new standard is the overlay of the, the notion of control. Because I think it does seem from the way the, the guidance has been crafted that the overarching principle is whether or not there is control. And I think, like others have said, we would perhaps typically have started from thinking about who is the customer in the arrangement. Uh, and that does seem to me to be important because if the, if the intermediary's customer is the originator, that makes it sound a bit like the, um, the intermediary is going to be agent. If the intermediary's customer is the end user, then perhaps you need to think about whether or not the intermediary does, in fact, obtain control. Uh, and I think when you look at the, the indicators, I think they can actually give you a, a, conflicting, um, a conflicting solution. Because I think if you focus on the one hand on primary obligor and on the other hand on, on who controls the economics. And I guess my sense of um, where the the new guidance might be challenging is that I'm not sure that all of those strands are completely pulled together. So for example, do you start off by just thinking about control or do you start off by thinking about the indicators? Um, do you start off by thinking about the customer or who is the customer? Or do you start off thinking about the indicators? Is it important to think about primary obligor in all of the circumstances, or do you think about whether or not one party or another drives the economics? And I think one of the, the interesting notions that a couple of the, of the examples specifically introduce is the idea that the, um, the um, intermediary might control a right before it is delivered to the end customer. So I think the example about airline tickets talks about controlling the right, and you say that the, the, the intermediary actually bought yep. an inventory. Uh, I guess I wonder how you might think about that uh, in the context of balancing the control of the economics with primary obligor if the inventory is not purchased beforehand. And so I, I, I guess my overall sense is comfortable with making the judgments, but I just wonder if there's a couple of strands of this that um, might be pulled together a bit more clearly, given the overlay of, of, of control in the, in, in the new model. How would you do that? I think it's the, the, the question, perhaps, for the boards is whether or not you intended to us to look at control as the first step and say, is there something that is controlled by the intermediary? I think like others have said, I, I, I think the originator is always going to be principal for something, but is there something that is controlled by the intermediary? Or is, do we start by looking at the indicators? Um, do you find that the basis doesn't perhaps pull those strands together? It, I mean, because I think what Brian was describing seems to sort of very much flowing 
yeah. know, the logic of the basis for conclusions, which I was just looking at. But I was wondering whether there was something in missing in the basis when you said pulling the strands together. The, the, the other thing um, to mm -hmm. touch on, I mean, there's always this challenge, isn't there, with the primary obligor mm -hmm. when you're talking about rights. Because if you're mm -hmm. essentially buying rights and reselling rights, yep. and of course you're not going to be the guy actually providing the underlying mm -hmm. service that the customer's fundamentally acquiring. So I think that has to be sort of considered when you're thinking about you know, the, the nature of the type of things we're talking about here. I think there were two questions, Henry. I, I think as far as the first is concerned, I think the... The, uh, the logic that seems to flow through the basis of conclusions is that the first question is whether or not uh, a party obtains control. And that the second question, or if, if, if that is not clear, then you look to the indicators to determine whether or not the party has control and is therefore principal in the arrangement. And I think the basis says specifically the indicators are there for a different purpose. But then I think, well, the indicators are pretty much the same as they were before. And I'm not sure when I look at what's in um, the application guidance, the flow comes through quite as clearly as it comes through in the basis for conclusions. And that's why I wondered whether, whether it, uh, it, it could be clarified. Um, and I do think that the, um, to pick up on your second question about the transfer of a right rather than delivery of the underlying goods and services. And I do think that's, that's an important notion. It's something that perhaps wasn't particularly clear in the IFRS space before. Um, and I think that the, there's, there's a couple of interesting questions around that, around whether or not an intermediary can control a right that didn't exist before the transaction. So it's actually granting that right as part of the transaction. Does the intermediary control that before the transaction, so if I issue a loyalty point, do I control that right before I issue it if I've negotiated the economics with the party that will fulfill it and the customer? Or um, if I had, um, I haven't taken the risk by buying any sort of inventory in it, does that mean that I don't control it beforehand? Other comments? Ian, there's... No, we, we don't have any more here, I don't think, Jim. So okay, there's a, there's a couple here maybe on this, and then we can move on to issue two. Ian, maybe we can start with issue two in, in, in London. Um, but I had uh, Alan over here. I, I think by, by first adding this, this control notion first, is actually adding complexity into the issue, meaning the uh, the criteria in current gap as well as in the new gap uh, on how to look at whether something is a principal versus an agent uh, is exactly the same. And I guess it's a question, did the board think that they were changing current gap by putting in the indicators as well as this control notion. Uh, I didn't think so. Uh, and if the board did not think that they were changing current gap, then really the indicators are what people should be looking to first as opposed to going to a first stop of control and then looking at the indicators. Because if you're gonna go to a first stop of control, you very well could get a different answer. Allison? <clears throat> Just reflecting on some comments I think Tony was focusing on a few minutes ago about needing to look at the control of the good or service, the question that comes up for me is the control of what? Is it the control of the underlying good or service that the customer ultimately receives, or is it control of the right to access the underlying good or service? And I think the airline example and the standard tries to make that distinction, but when you take that particular fact pattern and move it into more of an intangible or a virtual environment, it gets really tough. So let's go to Mark, back to Mark's fact pattern where we've got a restaurant that's selling or selling its services, selling it through Costco, and we were arguing or debating a little bit as to, well, you know, is, is if, if the $100 restaurant meal or whatever it is 
is being sold to Costco and Costco is then selling it on to its end customer at 100 or 95. You know, should Costco be recognizing that at 100? Should we be recognizing that at 90 or 95? I think that that's a question that sometimes you might think to yourself, well, does Costco have the right to that in the form of gift cards or some sort of item that you could argue is, is a form of inventory right, uh, inventory risk? But when you move that again into an intangible or a virtual type world, let's take a, a situation where a customer wants to get that $100 right to go to a restaurant, and let's say they're going to buy it through a discount website where they actually would pay $25 for a right to go into a restaurant and get a discounted meal. The, um, it, it, sometimes in those arrangements, the, in my example, $100 meal, $25 voucher that you're purchasing, that $25 voucher um, there may be a 50-50 split between the amount that the um, entity, the discount website, will ultimately retain versus the um, amount that's going to end up going back to the restaurant in that fact pattern. The question that comes up, should revenue be 25 or should revenue be 1250 Is it 1250 because that's the agency fee? Because ultimately what the customer wants, the underlying, this gets to my question of what is the control, the control of the underlying good or service. Is it that the end consumer wants the, the meal at the restaurant, the Discount website can't provide that. It's only the restaurant that can provide that. So the agency fee, the 1250, is the only amount of revenue that should be recognized by the discount website. Or is it that the discount website sold something for $25 and that they have a, an amount that they're paying back to the retailer in the form of 1250? So revenue's 25 and cost of goods sold is 1250 because they 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 sold. They're in the business of selling discount vouchers. So I think that's the debate, and I know that in fact patterns that we've dealt with the underlying determinant factor is what is the end consumer looking to purchase. They're not purchasing a discount voucher. They're purchasing the right to go to a restaurant for a meal. It's the control of that underlying good or service, and those fact patterns has been determinative. Russell? Maybe, maybe this is more of a process question. Um, you know, when I when I read this this guidance, and I think Larry was touching on this, it seems as though it was, it's consistent with existing. I think the, the intent was for it to be consistent. The control notion, I I think it's interesting, but it it seems consistent with the way people have placed more weight on primary obligor and general inventory risk. So it seemed, at least to me, to be consistent. So w one of my concerns about this this forum in this group is are we are we going to try and answer questions that we haven't been able to answer under existing gap and spin our wheels you know I, i'm surprised issue two is not what is a deliverable right so I, I i worry that you know if we don't focus on the things that are are sort of new and the interaction of of, of new words as opposed to concepts that are sort of the existing today that we that we struggle with that we haven't been able to answer in the past, I just worry that we're not going to be as as, as effective as we, we might be, so but otherwise be. I think that's a, a fair point, particularly with respect to, to this issue. But I think in part, at least from, from my perspective, th this was an issue where the board is getting educated, whether it's the new standard or exist, you know, even if we didn't have the, the new standard, is there a need for the boards to take some action so I, I appreciate that you could say it's it's in many respects not an issue and I think Scott said that as well when he answered no and no um, <laughs> that, that, yeah okay um, I had Mark Scott and then Russ can get in at any point you can, you can preempt the discussion if you want okay <laughs> um, I guess I, I was wondering I've heard a lot of conversation about step two and and what's the promise and um, and and control, but I was wondering what people thought about step one and the step one analysis of of, of identifying the contract, and whether or not that's illustrative or helpful at all in identifying the customer. In Mark Crowley's example of um, the steakhouse, you know, providing services through Costco, the contract is between. Um, Morton's and Costco. Is it possible, does anybody think it's possible that Morton's has a contract with a customer that it doesn't, I mean, I guess that's getting at Tom's implied contract. Do, do people think that that, you know, if you go through a step one analysis, does that help you at all in trying to figure out 
who the contract is with at least and who the customer might be to then figure out the promise to that particular customer. I was just wondering if people had any thoughts about that because that is a little bit different from current gap because I agree with Russell Hodge's point. You know, while the words might be similar in, in, um, in this particular implementation guidance with today's gap, the paradigm may or may not be a little different. So I'm just wondering what people think about that. You better, I, I think you have to exercise caution there because it, are you implying that perhaps the contract is between Morton's and this ultimate customer? Because if it is... No, I'm, 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 I was implying... It, it actually will be when somebody's got the gift card. Yeah, I mean, eventually, that, eventually. that guy shows up to Morton's and Morton says, no, I don't have a contract is with that you. Two, is that two separate contracts? And, and, and so I'm just wondering how people are thinking about the step one analysis. I've heard a lot about step two, and I'm just wondering if step one is helpful at all. I've tried to make it helpful under current gap. I mean, it, it, current gap doesn't have that guidance, but... I think you still got to figure out who your customer is and what your contract is. So I think it's already there. I, I, I mean, the, the fact that it's explicit in the new standard and isn't in current gap, I don't think changes practice. We already start out by figuring out what's the contract, who's the customer, and what have we promised to do. And we'll do that under the new guidance. And I, I think it will be similarly difficult. I, I did want to respond briefly. Henry mentioned the basis for conclusions. What and asked whether it helps. It, it didn't help me because it has all the same points of discussion as the standard and still is unclear as to whether there's an order, right? It starts out BC 381, identifying an entity's promise in a contract is fundamental to the determinant of whether the entity is acting as principal or agent. If I stopped there, I could say all I got to do is read the contract. Then goes on to say, however, to conclude whether they're a principal or agent, you also have to consider whether it controls the right before transferring it to the customer. And then the very next sentence, the nature of the entity's promise may not always be readily apparent. So I think the basis does what the standard does as well in terms of pointing out things that are all important. I don't mean to suggest that it's needlessly confusing anything, but it's pointing out a number of things that are all important without telling you but here's the only one to look at. So, so I'm going to try to articulate what I, what I think I'm hearing the, the concern. And I don't think it's because of the new standard. I think it's, I think it's both the old and the new. It, it is that there is a confusion or uncertainty about how to deal with transactions whereby the intermediary has no inventory risk because the, the transaction does not uh, result, it's, it's not a cost, M meaning the gift card has virtually no uh, cost to it. So the supplier doesn't need to get an upfront payment, unlike detergent. E even though, in this case, the intermediary has probably the same agreement that they would have with Procter & Gamble. If the detergent doesn't push through the system, they'll push it back. There's no debate there. People don't argue who the customer is. I'm the customer when I go to the intermediary, intermediary and I buy the detergent. And the intermediary is the customer to, to Procter & Gamble when they buy the detergent. But the intermediary has the ability to push that back. They have the ability to get price concessions if they don't do the detergent. So it seems to me the issue is, that that's the first issue. The second issue is when you basically have, for lack of better words, intermediaries that are making a market. And we have the ability to determine how market makers account for things when they make markets in financial instruments, but we're not sure how to deal with it when you make, mar when you make markets in other activities because, because you don't know who the other side is. Th those are what I hear the two issues are, and, and you, there's just uncertainty how to deal with it be because those scenarios did not exist when the original uh, thing that Jim – I don't know if you created, but it was done around the, in the late '90s. Is is that really what I'm? Am I hearing that right? Okay, is that, is that what I'm hearing? Is the the issues? One of the things that I was wondering about is in the example that Mark had given is whether my end customer is the uh, store or my end customer is the. Uh, 
the, the person who bought the gift card and came in for the meal, do I ever have an expectation of getting paid more than the $70? And if I don't have that expectation, does that determine that my transaction price can't be more than $70, irregardless of who my customer is? Yeah, but I don't hear the issue being the restaurant. I hear the issue being the intermediary in that scenario. It's so because the intermediary can change whatever they want. They don't really have any risk because they only pay the $70 if Scott comes in to buy the card. And so it's the, it's the confusion of you have no risk in that. I would argue that these major intermediaries have very little risk in all the other products that they sell because they can push it back, and that doesn't seem to be a problem to anybody. So I don't understand, honestly, why the gift card's a problem for the intermediary. So I, I think, though, your question, Michael, is a perfect segue <laughs> to issue two, which gets to, I think, the question of the, the, the re in that fact pattern, is your revenue the 70 or – and maybe people don't think that in the gift card scenario, but I think it certainly comes up in other scenarios, is do you need to look through to the ultimate end user if you're the originator – and somehow impute the revenue that's there, particularly in fact patterns where you have no idea what the intermediary is selling for, or I think in, even in Mark's example, the intermediary may pay for it and choose to give it away. Do you then have no revenue, in fact, when you received revenue? And, and Ian, if you'd like, you, you want to start the discussion on the second issue in, in London? Yeah, fine, thanks, uh, Jim. Anybody like to make some comments on issue two? Down here? Oh, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this maybe links back a bit to the discussion that we've been having for the past while because. I think that the focus really comes back to the basic principle of who is delivering and who is facilitating. And I think that my view when just jumping back into the control point is if control is not obvious, then the indicators are there to help you work out what people are actually doing. And that comes back to what's in the contracts of what people are providing to each other. So. When I get on to issue two, the focus for me is very much on am I providing this or am I facilitating someone else in providing it? Um, that would then probably for issue two take me either to PUA or conceivably D. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that if someone else can sell something for their price and you have no idea what that price is and you've got no interest in that price, how does it concern you? And how has it got anything to do with the contract that you've got with your customer? If I go back to the simple example of the restaurant, um, there was uh, a note from our US colleagues that there seemed to be two contracts. And I think that that is, in fact, key to it. Because the restaurant has got a contract with the intermediary. That contract is for the intermediary to introduce customers. There's then a second co contract between the restaurant and its customer where the restaurant sells the good, in this case the meal, to the customer. And that then pushes you in the direction of who's facilitating the transaction, which is the intermediary, in this case Costco, and who's actually providing the service, in this case the restaurant. And that for me is, pushes me into working out whether someone's going to have a net amount of revenue or whether someone's going to have a gross amount. And so what would your answer be in the restaurant? On the restaurant, it feels to me like there is a net facilitation fee going to Costco, and then there's whatever, is, whatever the restaurant gets for the meal. In this case, I think some people have hit, said $70. If that's what they get, that's what they get. And, and so if the intermediary sells it for, um, for 90, they've got revenue of 20. So what you that would seem to be the implication, yeah. Any other tiny? It comes back to if you're thinking of, if you think about it from the perspective of the intermediary, it's who is the intermediary's customer in that circumstance? Because if the intermediary is providing a service on behalf of the restaurant, that implies that um, 
it's acting on behalf of the restaurant to procure people to walk through the front door, which might imply the restaurant ought to be accounting for that gross with a fee knocked off. But in fact, if what the um, the intermediary is doing in with, with sorry with the the, the fee provided um, recorded as an expense, but if the intermediary is providing something, selling a right effectively to the customer, then that might suggest that that, that the um, the accounting would be um, net in the books of the yeah. So I, I think it's very much dependent on on identifying the customer in that situation. Any further comments? Um, yes, well, right. Similarly, um, to the previous question, I, I was saying that the key is what's the nature of the promise. Um, and I think if the originator has absolutely no idea um, what the end user is actually paying, that's almost certainly telling me something about the nature of the promise that the originator's making. Um, so there's quite a good chance, I think, um, that I would get to view A in that case. But I think that that information is still only informing my decision. So, so, so in a way, I have a gating question that might either take me to view A or might just conceivably, in a fact pattern I can't quite imagine, um, leave me with an open question. Mm -hmm. And then if I have that open question, um, I think I may have a different category of question that's actually quite a practical question about what kind of information I'm going to put in the financial statements if I really don't know how much the person I believe to be my end customer um, is paying me. But are you saying, therefore, today you haven't really seen an example whereby, you know, having really analysed it carefully, you've concluded that the intermediary is really an agent but you have, you know, you've got this problem about having no visibility into what the sort of end revenue amount is and what, and what the commission is. Um, in the, I'm, I'm not sure if I dealt with this question personally before seeing the paper. In the two weeks since yeah. I've had the paper, I haven't identified um, the fact pattern. But given that my answer to the first question was all about indicators and making adjustments, I feel in the interest of consistency, I need to leave open the possibility that um, I might get to somewhere else in, in, in fact pattern I don't have at my fingertips. Mary. Um, Ian, when thinking about the steakhouse uh, example, which I think is helpful for me because it's a, an intangible, the card, the right, back, backed up by a tangible, one thing that strikes me is if somebody took view A in terms of Morton's obligation performance obligation is to transfer the good or service to the intermediary, in this example, Costco, not to the end customer. Does that, in, does that imply to people that Morton's would recognize revenue for that transaction when it delivered the card, even if that delivery, having placed blank but not authorized cards at Costco, let's say they become authorized the moment Costco sells them on, would Morton's recognize the revenue when that card was delivered on when Brian walked in and, and, and bought a card at Costco, or would we expect them, Morton's, to wait until it had actually delivered the meal to recognize the the revenue? Um, and, and just thinking about you know the imp the further implications of uh, view A and view B um, with with respect to timing rather than rather than amount and. You know, if you think through it, it that way, does that impact your, you know, your your choice or your your assessment of uh, both the nature of the promise and who is the customer? So you're saying, in those circumstances, view why wouldn't make any sense. Well, I guess I'm saying if if we're so, you know, if we have have we focused down so narrowly in in thinking about this and maybe got a bit caught up in some of the. Mechanics. I think Mark's example of Morton's in the Steakhouse being a little more tangible than the uh, than, than the the pure gaming, the pure intangible scenario, makes me think if you take view A, Morton's performance obligation is transfer the good or service, which is the gift card, to the intermediary, which was Costco, not to the end customer, which is Brian. 
presumably when you fulfill your performance obligation, delivering the card, you recognize the, re the revenue. And would that, would that make sense at the time that the, the card itself is delivered to Brian, it, you know, if, if that's the performance obligation? Um, I'm, I, I have to say, I don't get tweet out that much. <laughs> um, so I may be um, a bit more up on the gaming fact patterns. But, but, but I wonder, in answer to your question, um, I assume that in these fact patterns, um, the restaurant actually has an obligation to serve the customer who's purchased the card. So it comes back to what's the nature of the promise. On the one hand, to transfer the right, yeah. uh, but also to honour the right, <laughs> whoever happens to be holding it at a point in time. And that would be an obligation to the intermediary as well, I think, to honour mm -hmm. the, the, inter the obligation the intermediary sells on would be a performance obligation. Yeah. So I don't yeah, I think, think it would be forward. It's a general principle that revenue recognition for granting of rights occurs when you grant the right and not when the receiver of the right starts to make use of the right. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I see that voucher as a right to go and, and have a meal, uh, like a piece of software with the right to use the software, I would recognize it when the right is granted mm -hmm. and the receiver can take the right and go and have the dinner, mm -hmm. not really at the time when the receiver decides to have the dinner. So other, other consideration, of course, if I fear that it may be returned and I need to give the money back, that's a different, different consideration. But if I've granted someone the right to come to my restaurant and have a dinner, why is that different to other rights that I grant where I usually recognize the revenue upon granting the right rather than upon when the, the, grant, the right is leveraged by the receiver of the right? Okay. I was going to make the, in response to Mary's question, I think I would see that um, the restaurant, if it has sold a right, would have a promise in its contract with the intermediary to honour that right when the um, customer walks into the restaurant. And I think the guidance in the standard would say that you would recognise that as a performance obligation. Mm -hmm. And so you wouldn't bring the revenue forward. And, and, and so you don't think that helps you in terms of looking at, is it view A, view B, view C? Yeah. Okay. Okay. No further comments? Back to you, Jim. So I, I think, Daryl, did you have the signal for yeah. two hands up? Yeah, I wanted to get in on, on Mary's question because I think she brings up an interesting observation. Um, the, the thing that I would say, though, is that I think most of these arrangements uh, would be such that, in our example, uh, Costco would not pay for that card until they sold it to their customer. And so, therefore, uh, the fact that Morton's delivered the card to Costco, yeah, maybe they've you know, satisfied their obligation to deliver that card, but I think they'd have trouble passing the collectability threshold at that point because uh, Costco is probably not going to pay for that card uh, unless and until they sell it to, to their customer. So, I mean, those cards could be thrown away, they would be useless, et cetera. So I think it would be hard uh, to expect uh, a recognition of revenue by Morton's at that point. Marty. Yeah, thanks. Um, I thought what Mark Siegel said a lot early, uh, earlier was very important, and that was maybe the fundamental aspect of the, uh, the standards says start with the contract, and as opposed to who is the customer. And it seems that, to your point, if there's a contract between Morton's and Costco, and they have sold that card to Costco, then that's one contract, and uh, Morton's would defer its revenue until it ultimately uh, had the meal delivered, but on the other hand, Costco would recognize its revenue when it sold the card to the customer. So there's, there's a couple of contracts there. There's a contract between Morton's and Costco, and later on there's a contract between Costco and, and the customer, and then Morton's fulfills its performance obligation when the customer comes in and recognizes its revenue. So I think, you know, from an auditor's perspective, looking at the contract, if you change the terms where well, they're not going to pay Morton's the cash until they sell it to a customer, then there's a different contractual arrangement, which affects, again, the timing of the arrangement. My, my only point being, it seems like 
trying to figure out customer and things like that before you figure out analyze the contract seems to be the starting point of your standard and the most compelling issue here. What is the contract at each point along, along the chain here? Allison? Just building off of the question that Mary was asking about the timing of revenue recognition, it just this question about, you know, if, if the originator of the transaction, if the restaurant is selling through its gift card, and if the promise in that obligation is to transfer the gift card and we're saying that that's the performance obligation, does that drive the timing? I think that question does exist even in looking at the example that's included in the standard for airlines, example 47, right? And that example, the conclusion is that the performance obligation is the right to fly, not the actual flying of the airplane. And so, as I've understood this example, the intermediary purchases the tickets ahead of time and arguably takes on the inventory risk and that that seems to be determinative. And so if, if we're saying that in that situation that the intermediary is the one that's responsible for fulfilling the performance obligation, that the performance obligation from the airline is to sell it to the intermediary, and that the intermediary there, then their re responsibility is to sell it on to the end customer, I think this, that might suggest that, you know, the logical conclusion might say, well, then the airline should be recognizing revenue at the time that they sell the ticket to the airline broker or the, the airline intermediary here in this fact pattern. But in practice, I don't think that's what happens. I think that the airline recognizes revenue when they fly the plane, regardless of who it is they're selling the tickets to. But yet in example 47, where you've reached the conclusion that in some instances, the intermediary can recognize the revenue for the tickets because their underlying obligation isn't flying the plane, it's providing somebody a right to fly. And this goes back to my question of well, what are we trying to define? What is the underlying promise that we're trying to sort of target in terms of revenue recognition. The promise for the airline. Sorry, for the intermediary. So Again, but what is the promise that we're accounting for? But we're two different parties, though. The airline has a different promise than the intermediary, so the intermediary's accounting can be different than the airline's. So, so, so what I'm trying to figure out is what, why does the, the fact that the intermediary could get revenue when they sell it leads one to believe that the airline should get revenue when they sell the ticket to the intermediary. Well, I'm not saying that they should. I'm just saying that that's just, uh, I think that was, if I've understood Mary's question correctly, she was trying to figure out whether whether there was some sort of interconnection between the conclusion about gross versus net and how that influences the timing of revenue recognition for the originator in the transaction. Tom? I thought it was about the customer, as you suggested, but I, I'm, I'm, agree, I'm beginning to agree with the gentleman in London, at least in thinking about it, what Marty says. It's thinking about the contract as a whole and identifying what the promise really is and to whom and at what price. We've been talking about Morton's and Costco and suggesting perhaps that the contract between Morton's is, is with the end customer to, to deliver the meal. But if that and that Costco might be an agent to identify a customer for that. But if we were to think about what the gross revenue would be then, it would be more than 70. Because somehow if Costco's an agent, there has to be some agent price in there. The $70 ends up being a net price because what happens in the, in the economics of that transaction is the agent fee is the difference between the 70 that Costco paid Morton's and what they receive, if that's the agency price. And if you were thinking about it, would not, would not a gross revenue be somewhat more than 70, less the commission you pay an agent, if that was just an agency? Or, and, and if that's not the case, then is the promise really to the end customer or is the promise, if you think about the promise to whom and at what price, is the promise to Costco to deliver meals to peep the customers they identify? And therefore, Costco is then reselling, and they would be principal. Just open questions, but I think the view about identifying the promise to whom and what price is allows us to think better about what the control and indicators are related to. Just an observation. Mark. Yeah, it, this is Mark. Um, 
And I think Tony hit on it um, over there. I think the obligation that uh, in in its the gift card examples just easy to understand because I'm I'm probably older and don't understand these virtual goods too well. But it could apply the same as if you sell a bag of fake coins that you can then go build buildings with, I guess, online or whatever my kids do. But um, the obli- you know, the coins themselves, and it gets into what Mary was talking about. Are are, the, are we selling the coins and the right to go? use those coins on my hosted website to build build bigger buildings or to buy cows or fake cows or whatever you do online or um you know is it the coins themselves and we've always looked at it um i you know like allison said that the obligation is and in my my case i would say it's an obligation to the intermediary i'm the if i'm the hoster that i'm going to honor whoever whichever one of their customers come in it's my obligation to the intermediary so that's why we we would look at it as um, you know, that's the customer relationship. It's the intermediary in this case, the Costco. It's the obligation if I'm a steakhouse to to honor whatever customer of Costco comes in. I'm going to honor that gift card on behalf of my obligation to, to Costco, not necessarily my obligation to the ultimate customer. I think it's not dissimilar from sort of what what Marty said as well. Thinking about what is the contract and what is the promise is certainly the way that that I have to think about these things. When people use the term virtual goods, it actually annoys me because I don't don't know what that means. In some cases, I think what people are doing is selling software. In other cases, I think what people are selling is gift cards. So so this is just how I look at it. Coins, or as Mark described them, fake coins on the Internet that I can use to purchase software or I can use to purchase other things, I have a hard time distinguishing why that's any different than if I called that a gift card that had a nominal value on it or a notional value on it, rather. Uh, So I think, at least in part for me, it's helpful to think about what is the promise and who is the promise to. Larry. But if if you use what I I believe was um, Marty's suggestion as to the thought process, I think it would automatically lead you to to um, recognizing, let's say, Costco has to pay $70, $70 um, on Morton's side, and I think it would, I think the, the rationale would be that you would recognize revenue gross at the intermediary level, at least that's that's the way I thought of it. And I guess one question that I had is it, it doesn't seem like these transact the, the gift card, the Costco Morton situation, is all that different than selling consignment inventory, um, which I think would lead you to answering the intermediary question that you would get, you would, you would record that at whatever you get. Um, and I guess one question in my mind is, and I don't know if this should influence your decision, would Costco or could Costco ever sell that gift card for less than the amount that it's required to pass on to, to Costco? I could come in with a Costco-issued coupon. Okay. And get the gift card for $20 off because I had and, a coupon And Costco. therefore, even though they don't really have the inventory risk, which is not all that different than consignment inventory, um, might might that be an indicator that we should look to for purposes of answering the intermediary question? That gets back to some people were saying to look at the economics, who controls the economics. In the consignment inventory example, though, would you say, though, at some point the retailer, let's say, actually does have control, maybe only for you know, the minute that it takes Jim to check out? So the, there is a, a clear point where you do take control of this physical good and then you pass it along versus, you well, know, this. While I understand that thought process, Colin, I, I, I think it <clears throat> to, to think about instantaneous control I don't think is all that helpful in answering the question. I think um, what would be more helpful is, is it, is it within your authority as the intermediary to generate a profit or generate a loss. And in those, you know, if, if the answer to that is you can do either, then perhaps that leads you to a conclusion that the intermediary should be accounting for this, you know, as, as an inventoryable item, despite the fact that they don't have inventory risk, per se. Uh, 
that, that may lead you to gr gross accounting at Costco for the gift cards because it, it's very likely they have the ability to sell those for whatever price th they can. I mean, they gross give, being defined as what? A oh, at Costco, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah, because sorry. they may that, be that, able to sell that for whatever that, price they can. What, whatever the that, case, I, I, I want to come to a conclusion that says that Morton's doesn't have to guess what their I, revenue is. I, I, can get, I can get to that conclusion without, without doing, putting at risk some other things. What you just said about if the intermediary's got pricing risk, that tells me, uh, and I'm going to call out a company's name, not because I'm focused on that company, but because everybody's heard of it, Groupon would be gross. And that was a very high-profile situation where they moved to net after significant discussion because Groupon can, if they wish, offer make their offers to users and give the user a, an incentive. Say, hey, you haven't bought a Groupon in a while. Uh, you can buy your next one for half off. And that's not going to change what Groupon has to remit to the restaurant store or whatever it is. Uh, so I think we, we run the risk, which we always do in these kind of situations, of talking through things in such detail and at such level that we identify problems that hadn't previously been thought of as problems. For example, today, Morton's does not recognize the revenue from the sale of a gift card until somebody comes and gets the meal. There, there is no question. There may be a question as to amount on the gross versus net, but we started talking about the when. I think Morton sells to Costco a promise to provide a meal to whoever presents a gift card. The promise is clear. And so Morton's has revenue when the gift card is presented or when there's breakage. That, I mean, I, I think the timing is clear. I, I agree with you completely, Larry, on the amount that Morton's should recognize. Morton's has agreed to provide a meal for 70 bucks. That's their revenue. Right. And, and Larry, to your point about whether the cards held by the intermediary are an inventoriable item, I, I believe that in, in most cases, they, they don't even recognize necessarily that they have these cards. I mean, they're, the plastic cards are worth two or three cents. They can be thrown away, lost, whatever. They are not worth hardly anything until they're activated at that register. And so think it would be hard for them to think about them as as being something of value that, that they would have an in inventory why wouldn't you think of it as having the right to sell a meal that cost you 70 it's not the card at three cents the inventory is you've been given the right to sell a meal an intangible right at this point and I think you have the price risk in that because if you're gonna pay 70 for it and you can sell it for anything else I think there's some fright, at least the margin, that, you're, that you're, you have at risk. But, Tom, you can't have a risk if you don't sell it. If you don't sell it, there is no risk, which is, I think, what Darryl, where Daryl's heading is. The, the, the card is just a vehicle to convey at a point in time in which it sells that card. That's when the product is created, if you will. There is no product until there's a transaction. That depends on whether whether Costco pays for the cards ahead of time I, or at the true. time They're different of identifying the customer. I, exactly. to the One question I have is, you the grocery store, when did you pay for the cards? I, that was my point earlier, was that I probably would not pay the restaurant for the cards until the customer buys the card from me. Right, right. So, so if that's the case, even if it was inventory, what would be your journal entry? But isn't the real question in that situation whether the, the store, the Costco, Daryl probably knows this from his background, should they, do they recognize it gross or net when they actually sell the card? You know, I think that's, that's the question. You know, I go to the grocery store, there's a wall of gift cards I could buy. I go to the grocery store and I buy a, gift, a $25 gift card at Target. Okay, and I pay the grocery store 25 bucks. The grocery store probably pays Target 23 bucks. Does the grocery store recognize $2 in revenue or 25 in revenue and 23 in costs? My guess is under the current literature and how they would think they would do it under the new, they recognize 2 
Yes. Is that right, Daryl? I, mean, I think you would know that from your <laughs> I think background. that's right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're, we're off of issue two and back to the intermediary what question now. But, but I think that's, that's a big deal. But, Scott, if that's a commission, then does the restaurant recognize gross revenue of no, 72 no, no, no. and a commission of two? No, the grocery store is working for the end customer, not for Target. Scott had a warning or caution earlier. I actually think we're creating issues that don't exist in practice today, potentially. Uh, but but Sue, and then on to issue three. Uh, one of the questions that I had, we've had a lot of discussion about the intermediary and so forth. But I know Rita, as an, a user and investor, I wondered if you had a perspective, particularly with respect to the intermediary, on some of these situations as to whether what information is more valuable to to an investor. It really does, in my mind, depend on how the contract is written. And to the point on Costco, I think it is more of an, a commission. It, but that's specific to that type of good in that period. The confusion from an investor point of view is that you can take the same two um, originators and the same two intermediaries and have some be commission and other be principal, and when they're reported to an investor, they're commingled. So I, you know, that is part of the problem. Mary, do you mind teeing up the third issue for us? Anyway? The third issue was how should the transaction price allocation guidance be applied to a transaction in which the entity is a principal for some of the deliverables and an agent for others? Ian, looks like we don't have any comments on the third issue here. <laughs> Do we have any comments? Yes. Yes. Uh, what was discussed, I think the example of Morton and Costco was very interesting, but I'm not so familiar about those uh, companies. So maybe for the next example that you give, if you could explain a little bit who those companies are, it could be useful. <laughs> uh, the second thing I wanted to say is here we are talking, my understanding is that uh, they are already today with existing guidance uh, examples that are difficult to deal with, and I understand that IRS 15 is not going to help. However, there are many cases, especially for goods, where agent versus principal is, uh, is uh, very useful today. And our understanding was that the guidance is not going to change with the new standard. So, uh, especially for what I'm talking about uh, intermediaries, which are distributors. We are using the current guidance of agent versus principal. And uh, our understanding is that it's the same indicators that have been uh, using f uh, in IFRS 15. And we don't expect differences in the analysis. However, and this is an implementation uh, issue for preparers, we are still going to do the analysis of the agents versus principal transactions that uh, we have had in the past because we consider that a new standard on revenue will be the opportunity to make sure that we deal with those uh, indicators in, uh, with homogeneity. We might in the past have done several analyses, but not at the same time. Or we might also have acquired company where we didn't do the analysis. We just took for granted the analysis that they had performed. So even though we don't expect differences, we are ready to do an analysis agent versus principle to make sure that this is applied consistently within our, in our company. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? No, question three is not, not bringing on, along a lot of comment. Maybe it's because we've been going nearly two hours. <laughs> getting to have, so have, to you, Scott, Tom's got a, his flag up here, Ian. Well, I'll, I'll be short. I mean, I, my sense is that this is not as concerning to people because I, I think – 
in most arrangements where this is the case, the, the answer kind of falls out from the way the contracts work. I mean, I, for example, consider an entity uh, that uh, provides technology solutions, and so they, they buy equipment and resell it, and then they also do a, a bunch of services to get that equipment installed and up and running. So they're, you know, they, they've got a gross situation on some of the equipment and a net situation on other the uh, other equipment, depending upon whether they just arrange for it to be shipped straight there or hold it in inventory themselves ahead of time. And the pricing arrangements are usually so clear that, you know, uh, on the equipment that they're just going to order and have drop shipped and perhaps would be net on, the arrangement with the customer is just kind of a cost plus. You're going to pay the cost of that equipment, and then you're going to pay our fee. And it is the our fee portion that is negotiable. And so you wind up, I think, in a situation where nobody really questions where the discount goes. It's, it's just obvious from the pricing. So my, my sense is that that this question doesn't necessarily really get thought of all that much because people just look at the pricing in the contract, and that's the way it goes. And I think that would probably in most cases put you in the situation where you meet the criteria to allocate the discount entirely to one of the elements. And people don't really think about it as a discount even. So if I'm hearing right, it seems like at least as potential issues, there's there's greater challenge in applying the judgments in the, the first two for, for those that are listening or paying attention, the objective w was not to necessarily provide any guidance or resolve issues. So if you, if you walk away saying you're sort of dissatisfied with the end result of that discussion, it's really to inform the boards of, uh, of whether there is an issue to take on. We appreciate, I think, that there is judgment, but is that judgment within in a bound that people know how to uh, make the decisions that they need to? And that's the follow-up that the boards uh, will have after this meeting, and I think that the discussion has been useful in, in providing us uh, input to, to have those subsequent discussions. Uh, we're, we're about five minutes behind on the first issue, so with, with that, I think if, if people are okay, and Ian, is your sense that folks are comfortable in London moving on to issue the second uh, broad issue? Yeah, that's fine, Jim. Okay. Which, by the way, won't move on from the topic of gross versus net, by the way. <laughs> Mary also has Can, this issue. I just got J James would like to make a comment. I'm just not quite clear. What's the feedback that then comes from the board post this in terms of, I mean, those were quite inconclusive discussions. What's the feedback <laughs> that then comes back from that in terms of what happens from here when the board then reviews, say, points one and two? I think we now will have to reflect on what we've heard, but as sort of Cullen was explaining with the process, essentially, you know, we will certainly report back at the next meeting, you know, uh, hopefully we can report back about what we intend to do or in response to what we've heard today. Now, there could be situations whereby actually we may not yet have made that decision, but we'll report that back to you and, you know, follow up in, in due course. Um, but it is obviously very important that there's a, a clear feedback loop to this group and also obviously to all of the, the stakeholders. Thank you. But uh, I think you make an interesting point that um, it's going to be interesting to write up this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> That's <fine. laughs> Okay, sorry, Jim. Okay, so, so moving on to the second paper. Some stakeholders have informed the staff that there may be multiple interpretations of the application of the guidance in the new revenue standard in determining whether to present certain items billed to customers as revenue or as a reduction of costs. Some examples include shipping and handling fees, reimbursements of other out-of-pocket expenses, and taxes or other assessments collected from customers and remitted to governmental authorities, for which explicit guidance in U.S. GAAP was superseded by the new revenue standard. Additionally, under existing IFRS, amounts collected on behalf of third parties are excluded from revenue. The guidance on transaction price in the new standard states that the transaction price should exclude amounts collected on behalf of third parties. Sometimes it may not be entirely clear whether or not the amounts are collected on behalf of third parties. In those cases, some stakeholders have expressed a view that the entity should apply the principal agent framework. 
So the FASB and the ISB would like the members input on your views about this potential issue, whether you're aware of any um, other interpretations or any other related interpretation issues related to this topic. Participants in, in Norwalk, any discussion on the second paper? Oh, Allison. This was an interesting discussion that we had both within our U.S. practice and then in talking with colleagues around the world. And maybe it's because there's a U.S. bias towards thinking that certainly shipping and handling and out-of-pocket costs would be recorded as part of revenue consistent with current practice. And so I think there is a bias within the U.S., or at least there's a concern that there would be this bias that you would interpret a lot of those gross versus net indicators to point towards gross revenue recognition, at least in the United States, because that's consistent with current practice. Again, with respect to shipping and handling and out-of-pocket costs, with respect to international perspectives, you know, what I'm hearing from my colleagues overseas is that oftentimes maybe some forms of shipping type services might be recognized gross, but oftentimes handling costs, um, very often if those are internal type um, costs, that those likely would not be incorporated within revenue under today's practice. And so I think that there might be a bias to approach it, the gross versus net analysis, a, a different way, um, thinking through questions about profit margin, et cetera. I think in the United States, consistent with how the EITF reached its conclusions back in 0010, there's a lot of focus on, well, you could price your goods any number of ways to capture shipping costs, and that the fact that you've priced it into your goods versus separated it separately on the invoice, that really shouldn't be a determining factor when reaching the conclusion about gross versus net revenue. So I think that that mindset will continue under U.S. GAAP. So when we've talked about it within our global group, folks overseas are saying, well, hey, wait a minute. If, if that's the mindset, then there probably is a need for additional guidance here to help make sure that, that, the, uh, that the framework is applied consistently. And then with respect to taxes, I thought it was actually interesting when I read the paper talking about amounts collected on behalf of others I think most of us have, have just read that and kind of glossed right over it and said, okay, that's great, taxes are not included within revenue. And so it was interesting that, that the paper makes a distinction that perhaps there might be some circumstances when you would. And I thought to myself, well, I'm wondering if others would really pick up on that fact that there might be situations when you would in include something that people would think of as taxes in that gross revenue line item. And so therefore, if that's something that people would overlook, is that another area where further clarification is needed? Allison, can you, can you help me understand your point about you, you were saying outside the U.S. there might be a view that there's difference between a third-party shipping cost versus internal? Well, I think if, if a company is performing the shipping services themselves or has discretion in supplier selection or is potentially earning a margin off of that, that, that there might be a view, even under today's practice under IS-18, okay, that, that's, that, the, that the shipping part is revenue, but any things that might be thought of as handling and that that's not really defined in the literature, but handling costs might be the internal costs that you would incur for the materials for the shipping, for the overhead costs to, to run a shipping department to pull things together for a customer, that some of those handling type costs might be not thought of as direct costs related to providing the shipping, and so those would be recorded not as part of a revenue generating item, but just recorded purely as an expense. And I, I wonder if they think about those questions mostly because they're separated on the invoice because otherwise it seems hard you know where do you draw the line in terms of what the costs are there's you know right. potentially thousands of costs that make up the shipment of one product it just so happens that you've decided to or you've been able to call out you know two of the thousand right and i guess that that as i've understood it from past EITF can work on this particular issue that it's difficult to decide what is really a shipping cost, what's really a handling cost, and, and so however you kind of define that, that you end up recording that as a, as a gross amount of revenue, that you wouldn't end up um, reflecting any reimbursements of those amounts as a reduction of cost. Rita? Uh, from the point of view of following e-commerce com companies, it seems to me that shipping cost in particular has become a competitive tactic um, that is not related to their cost of buying shipping services. Uh, so larger companies will have a discount, and then e any size company is using shipping offers as a promotion and, you know, it varies by day, by day part, et cetera. The other thing with regard to shipping costs, um, 
Amazon has fulfillment by Amazon where they charge people on their marketplace for shipping services as well as warehousing, et cetera. It's all bundled in. They're receiving fees for that discreetly. So it's it, um, they're in that case the third party. You, you would definitely want to be recognizing that shipping. Scott. I think I probably read this too simply, uh, but I, I was applauding the boards for an having answered this question uh, in one sentence in the definition of the transaction price. The amount of consideration that the entity expects to be entitled in exchange for transferring promised goods or services to the customer, excluding amounts collected on behalf of third parties. So unless you're collecting the money because the customer owes someone else and you're just passing it through, it's part of revenue. I, I, I actually, I was done after reading that. I, I was lamenting the fact that uh, everybody in the U.S. now has to figure out in every jurisdiction whether the sales or excise tax is being levied on the company or the customer because in EITF 063 we took a pass on that. And this, I thought, made it clear that you got to figure it out. Got to analyze 50 states. 50 states, 1,000 cities, countries, whatever you got, but you got to figure it out. I, I thought that made it clear, which, by the way, I think is the right answer. Um, but I, for everything else, all these sh shipping and handling costs, everything else that you might pass through or not pass through, it looked to me like it was gross. The only way it wouldn't be was if literally – it was the customer that chose and contracted with the shipper, and you just offered to funnel the money through. And I don't know why companies would do that, but I could certainly see situations when they might. That also might be the case if you sell insurance on the goods that you ship. It may well be that the insurance contract is solely between the end customer and the insurer, and the money passes through, but you're collecting on behalf of somebody else. So that would be one where it would be excluded. But uh, just about everything that I he see here, out-of-pocket costs, shipping costs, travel, all that kind of stuff, I actually thought this made it clear that the answer was gross. Um, Scott, could I just follow up with a question there? Just I, I understand this might have been partly uh, as, as a result of joint drafting, but would you, for example, think it would be easier if the, the definition of transaction price didn't say, for example, some sales taxes, but instead, in your view, you think that really sales taxes could be without the sum qualifier in front of it? Well, no, because I think that some things that are labeled sales taxes are literally a tax on the seller, and some are literally a tax on the purchaser. Okay. So I thought... Some sales taxes was basically telling you you got to figure out who actually owes the tax. Th that was the intent of some. Oh, I got one. Okay. Jay. Scott, I'm just re reacting to what you said about lamenting the uh, idea of having to go through every jurisdiction where sales tax may be collected, uh, the thousands of jurisdictions. And I recall sitting here as an EITF member when that, that EITF issue was decided that that I, my, my recollection, foggy now, was that that was more of a practical expedient of it didn't seem to be a problem that needed to be solved that just disclose what your policy is. And if you do gross up for for uh, sales taxes, disclose that, 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 that amount. Um, and it just kind of seems to be a counterproductive activity to, to essentially force everybody to go through every single jurisdiction to figure that out so any given company could have a wide range of whether it's grossed up or not. And I don't recall if there's anything in, in the, the new standard relative to disclosure or, or around that, but uh, um, it doesn't seem to be productive activity. And I'm thinking about the work that auditors will have to do to come to grips with uh, what a company has done. That doesn't seem to be a productive activity either, but yet it seems to be necessary if that's what the conclusion is. I think Jay says you got one wrong, Mark. So, but I <laughs> Greg. Just want to add, uh, really echo Scott's comments. When we took a look at this, we kind of had the same reaction that, that, that you did, that it seemed to be fairly simple and straightforward. You know, having said that, uh, is, we didn't see anything wrong with the, you know, the guidance kind of points you to use the gross versus net guidance if you're confused about a particular cost, and we thought that might be an appropriate approach to use as well. 
for those that are not as clear maybe on, on the surface. Ian, over to you. Okay, thank you, Philippe. Thanks. Well, I think uh, as a follow-up of Scott's observations, uh, which are very clear and to which I fully concur, uh, it may be helpful uh, when you don't know for a tax, whether it is a tax on the entity or a tax on the customer that is collected by the entity on behalf of the taxation authority, to try to determine what happens when the customer doesn't pay. If the production price is not paid, is the tax still due? by the entity, in which case it seems to me it is a tax on the entity, if the entity can claim a tax deduction or a tax credit because the customer has not paid the transaction price, it seems to me that it was a tax on the customer, which is collected by the entity on behalf of the, of the, of the government. So I think it should help in clarifying. Would people agree with that view, or is it, not, uh, other, is it more complex than what I think? Or? I don't know. Tony. A uh, couple of observations. Um, I think the uh, the idea of whether or not a company should account gross for um, shipping and handling or for out-of-pocket expenses, I think I'd be inclined to go back to the model as a whole and say, <clears throat> is there a performance obligation <clears throat> excuse me, to a customer to provide shipping and handling or some other type of activity? And if there is is the nature of the promise to organize the shipping and handling, or is the promise to provide the shipping and handling? And uh, with that in mind, I think, subject to the conversation we had under paper one, my sense would be, let's use the guidance that we have. And I think I'd probably say we don't particularly need any, any more guidance that you can work through the model uh, to decide is there a separate performance obligation and if there is a performance obligation, uh, what is the nature of the entity's promise? Uh, as far as taxes are concerned, I think it is clear that the, that the judgment is around whether or not it's the entity being taxed or um, the customer being taxed, and in which case the entity is just collecting taxes on behalf of um, the government from, from its customers. Um, I probably wouldn't be, take, be perhaps as clear-cut as Philippe was. I think that's one of the factors that, 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 that you would take into account, and I think I'd be inclined to look at the, the indicators of whether a, an entity is principal or agent as perhaps being helpful, but because you need to look at a variety of taxes in, a different, part, in different parts of the world, I wouldn't necessarily say that they are absolutely definitive or any one indicator is definitive just because of the range of different taxes. Having said that, I think I'd still be in the, in, in, in the same place as saying I don't think <clears throat> there's a need for additional guidance in the area. I, I, I think you could um, apply the model. I'd say to, to what Alison said, perhaps that reflects my background of being used to applying the existing model to various types of taxes in the past. Christophe. Yeah, maybe to, to echo what Tony said about shipping and handling, uh, I think it would be very, very difficult to draw the line. Uh, so if I send a consultant to the customer and the consulting need to be performed on premise of the customer, um, the flight and, and other travel expense, you would say yes. If it is virtually, what about the leasing cost for uh, the internet and the other facilities through it is provided? So you could go a lot further by what is still a matter of handling, uh, in particular if it's not for physical goods. So I think we, we wouldn't find an end there. And I don't see uh, a lot of basis in the standard to get to a treatment as expense. It is painful because if you charge it to the customer at cost, it dilutes your margin. Um, but uh, I think any other approach, number one, would, would I think require significant changes to the standard to get there. Um, and I don't think would result in something that would be consistent accounting because we would fail in defi defining what is handling. Uh, about the taxes, um, we've had a number of instances in which we struggled in, in certain jurisdictions, maybe less with official sales taxes, but some countries have levies that are based on revenue. 
and then it's difficult to determine um, because it's sometimes not even very clear in the jurisdiction whether the criteria that Philippe mentioned are met or not met because the answer may be it depends. Um, and, and that's why that is something we're struggling with, but I, I don't see what guidance could be added to ease that struggling. I think that's simply um, a judgment struggle we've got to go through. Uh, about taxes, I have a lot of concern about using the agent versus principal framework. Uh, for example, for, in, for VAT in Europe, Clearly, companies are agents. It's a pass-through tax with zero commission, and all flows go through balance sheet and not PNL. So I don't see how it works in that example. And uh, for uh, most taxes, in, specifically in the pharma industry, we could say that the companies are principal, which means that they should maybe book them as expenses. However, they are linked with programs where governments will reimburse part of the drugs. So agent principle would not help to consider whether they should present it as deduction of sales or, or as expenses. And even though we were to book them as expenses, so it would be a change probably for some of, some of the taxes that we have today. Under IFRS, we would have to go through IFRIC 21 which means that in some circumstances, we would have to book them the year after, which is not something that American preparers would have to do because I don't think they have the equivalent. So there, it's really something very sensitive. I don't think that the framework agent principle by analogy is actually working for taxis. And uh, the impact are very important in terms of presentation and in terms of timing of recognition of the expense. Right. Perhaps just to reiterate um, what I believe international practice is at the moment, which is that this is absolutely um, a case-by-case -case, um, assessment. Um, in the case of uh, transport and shipping, maybe it's quite often gross. Um, but I've certainly purchased things um, going back to the internet. I've purchased things on the internet, and I've been able to select to the carrier, and the cost has seemed like like a pass-through. So I don't think. Um, transport and shipping is is necessarily always gross. Um, I, I would echo some of the complexities that can arise in assessing um, the taxes. Um, when you look around internationally, they are extremely complicated. Some of them are clearly related to sales. Some depend on production. Some depend on what percentage of what you produce you actually sell. Um, so it is um, inherently difficult, um, but internationally, that's not a new issue. Okay. Thank you. Any other, no other comments? Jim, back to you. I, any other comments here? Mark? Yeah. Um, thanks. It's Mark Crowley. Um, just one discussion that we had in our camp when we were talking about this, and I think we agree that you, I, with some of the other folks around here that it seems that there's going to be some judgment um, in – um, but we generally agree with, with where this was. But if, if we conclude under the new model that your principal in shipping and handling, um, and you look at the sort of the definition of a good or service, is that a service that now needs to be evaluated under the um, guidance along with whatever product you're delivering? So it gets into the question. I know there was an example in there, the original ED before, that said shipping and handling was a separate performance obligation. So it, it just came up in our, our camp of, we're saying we're principal in the shipping. Does that mean that now we have to evaluate it under step two as a separate deliverable? And does this sort of, um, you know, how do you deal with today? We would we would not say shipping is, is a deliverable in an arrangement. If I sell you a hat and ship it to you, you know, for $100, well, that's one deliverable. Does this suddenly, by under the model that that's, that is that is the, under the new standard, does it suddenly say, well, that makes you the principal in shipping, so therefore you have to evaluate it as a separate performance obligation, and and, and how do you deal with that? It's it's just something that came up, and um, and I don't know whether anyone has any other thoughts on it, but um, we didn't come to any conclusion one way or the other. Um, but I didn't think it was meant to change the practice of if I'm recording it gross and I sell you a hat for a hundred dollars, I'm going to recognize a hundred dollars when I hand it off to UPS. If I'm the principal in that arrangement, do I somehow have to bifurcate that now and and say? Mm -hmm. 
some of it relates to shipping, and I'm I'm going to defer some of it. Just came up. In that in that example, though, if 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 you are the manufacturer and I'm the customer, you make a widget and you ship it to me. If you were to say that the shipping and the product were separate performance obligations, which I'm not saying, but let's say that they Good. they were. <laughs> At the end of the day, the customer just wants the product. So the I, fact, I, the fact I, that you've manufactured it and put it on the shelf d doesn't necessarily take a step towards fulfilling the performance obligation to me. Yeah, not on the shelf. When you hand it to the carrier, whoever the carrier is, it's not you. I mean, if it's you, I guess you have to deal with other items, but you hand it to a third-party carrier. Is that, and it gets into the FOB shipping point and uh, FOB destination, and then you get this synthetic FOB destination. So I don't want to get into all that, but it's something that came up by calling it the principle. I think what we do today makes perfect sense that we, um, you, you either show gross or, or if you happen to be net, you, you disclose which way you do it. I think that'll be the same under this, but just want to make sure that it was clear by calling you know, saying your principal in that arrangement, because of the way we've defined goods or services in step two, that uh, it would be something you can't ignore, um, I guess, because inconsequential or perfunctory deliverables can't be ignored. Ian, last word before we take a break. In response to um, Mark's comment, I guess I thought of it around um, thinking about whether it was a separate performance obligation, thinking about when control of the goods transfers to the customer. So if the control of the goods transfers when those goods arrive at the customer's premises, so on delivery, it might be difficult to see shipping as being a separate performance obligation because the entity is delivering its own goods. But if on account of moving to a control model, control passes on shipment, then I think at that stage, shipping may well be a separate performance obligation, and that's when it might be necessary to think about whether uh, the entity is arranging for someone to ship or providing the shipping service. So that was the way I thought it through. I think there is a connection between those, those two yeah. things. That, um, you know. Okay, thank you, Jim. <coughs> Let's take a, a 15 minute break, come back at, um, in Norwalk, come back at 10.30 in London, uh, 3.30 or 15.30. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, everybody. Jim, should I get on with um, paper three? Please. Okay. So, who's team that up? Scott. So, thanks, Ian. Uh, I think we're just waiting for a couple people to uh, get settled. Uh, turning to uh, memo number three that was provided and issue three that we will discuss today, the new revenue standard stipulates that an entity should recognize revenue for a sales or usage-based royalty that is promised in exchange for a license of intellectual property only when or as the subsequent sales or usage occurs or when the performance obligation to which the royalty has been allocated is satisfied or partially satisfied. This means that any other royalty is subject to the general guidance on variable consideration, including the general constraint. Some stakeholders inform the staff that there may be in multiple interpretations as to the application of the royalty-specific constraint. Memo number three addresses different stakeholder interpretations of this guidance with respect to issues. Issue number one addresses different stakeholder interpretations of what it means for a royalty to be promised in exchange for a license of intellectual property, while issue two addresses different stakeholder interpretations as to whether a single royalty should be split into a portion that would be subject to the royalties constraint and a portion that would not be subject to the royalties constraint. With respect to issue one, the staff are aware of three interpretations of different stakeholders, which is summarized on page six of the memo that was provided. Interpretation A is that a royalty is promised in exchange for a license of intellectual property whenever that royalty relates to a license, regardless of whether the royalty also relates to another non-licensed good or service, and also regardless of whether the license is a separate performance obligation. Interpretation B is that a royalty is promised in exchange for a license of intellectual property only when it relates solely to a license of intellectual property, and that license is a separate performance obligation. Interpretation C is that a royalty is promised in exchange for a license of intellectual property whenever the royalty relates solely to a license of intellectual property or a license of intellectual property is the primary or dominant component to which the royalty relates. Issue number two comes into play where an entity concludes the royalty's constraint should not apply to the entire royalty. For example, assume the entity follows interpretation B with respect to issue number one and concludes the royalties constraint should not apply because the royalty relates to both a license and another good or service. Some stakeholders have expressed the view that the royalties constraint either applies to a single royalty or it does not. If it does not apply, then the entity applies the general guidance on variable consideration to that royalty in its entirety. Other stakeholders think that an entity should divide that royalty into the portion that relates to the license and the portion that does not and then apply the royalties constraint to that portion of the royalty that relates to the license. As with the previous two issues, we will now turn the discussion of the issues in Memo 3 over to the TRG members for their views on the potential implementation issues, whether the members are aware of other interpretations for any of the issues, and whether there are any related potential interpretation issues that the group should also consider. Okay. Why don't we start in London? Any uh, comments here? Emmanuel. Um, so uh, this is a very interesting issue and uh, as uh, uh, working for a pharma company we have been following this uh, the development related to what at the end end up with the exception related to royalties so I, I would like maybe to give some uh, general uh, background on this issue in order to answer to the first question, which is, when is a sales-based or usage-based royalty promised in exchange for a license of IP <coughs> such that the royalties constraint should apply? So today we have an exception, and uh, it, it seems to me that, although it, it seems to be rule-based today, there is ground to consider that actually it's principle-based. So let me explain why I I, I say that. The issue, let's imagine that we have uh, only a royalty flow on IP. So it's a very simple case. Then we can uh, complicate with different performance obligations. Uh, what we were saying as an industry is that where 
when we have a stream of royalty over 15 years, which is often the case in some of our collaboration agreements when a product is on the market, we say that actually this royalty stream represents profit sharing or risk sharing. It's long term. And even though the IP might have been transferred as a point of time, and we are not challenging that, uh, the consideration related <coughs> to the variable royalties is a type of risk sharing revenue that should be recognized over time with no assessment upfront and no reassessment. So the issue is whether it should always be the case. And some may argue that in some circumstances, when the flow of royalties is very short term, there might be a discussion. And I think what could be very helpful to solve the, the issue between what is a real risk sharing arrangement over long term and what could be considered as an outright sale where actually we could recognize royalties upfront uh, is actually a paper that was uh, uh, published uh, in April 2014 on leasing uh, related to variable leases and in, in substance fixed leases. And those two papers are very useful to understand also the royalty exception. And the paper on leasing are actually principle based. They are saying that uh, um, variable lease payments should be excluded from the liability and from the receivable because they are in substance <coughs> revenue sharing or risk sharing. Although when it's in substance fixed payments, they should be included in the liability. And it seems to me that the royalty, in order to really think of the royalty exceptions, exception, uh, making a link with that discussion that happened in April on leasing may be helpful. Uh, and uh, we can use it, for instance, for when there are different, uh, whether the IP is predominant. Uh, I have also seen an interpretation that we're saying that the exception should not be used when there is an IP with a fixed fee and uh, royalties, because it's an exception that is only done for variable consideration. But if we see the variable consideration as a risk sharing, actually it's also apply when we have a fixed fee and variable consideration. So it's maybe something that can help and the discussion that was done after the discussion on IFS 15, which is related to variable lease payments. Okay, thank you. Further comments? Brian. <coughs> So, very um, interesting introduction um, and interesting perspective on form fact patterns. And I've certainly heard from lots of people who are attracted by the ultimate counting to which I think that that thought process was leading. Um, it, it seems to me that there are at least two questions to ask before the question in the paper. Um, I think one of them is precisely Emmanuel's question, what really is the nature of the arrangement? Is it some kind of collaboration? Is it um, uh, some kind of sharing arrangement? Is it, is it something else? And the second question um, is what exactly is intellectual property? Um, all of the interpretations on question one in the paper assume that it's possible to make a very, very clear distinction and then having made that <coughs> distinction, they ask a question about um, how you deal when, with the case when you have both of these things present. Um, so I think there are some very important gating questions before you get to the question in the paper. I do think that once you get to the question in the paper, then I do come back to the idea that this is an exception. I followed the board discussions around it um, very closely, and I could see that the it seemed to be very influential in the board discussions that it moved forward the idea of this exception. 
in large part as a way of taking some of the heat out of the decision as to how to <coughs> classify a license, whether it was over time or point in time. And it seems to me that that, once you've got through the gating questions, that seems to be how um, the exception is functioning in the model. It seems to be within the part of the application guidance um, that's dealing just with licenses. And for that reason, I think I am very strongly influenced by the rationale for interpretation B. Um, I was interested by interpretation C. Um, and I can kind of see that if I had something that was clearly a license but just had something else that was very, very small in there, um, I don't think the presence of that very, very small thing should really affect um, what I'm doing. So maybe I'm in a kind of, maybe I'm not all the way to C, because I think the basis is the basis, not the main part of the standard. So maybe I'm in a kind of B+. Plus. Um, <laughs> But I think it's very important that I'm only there once I've got through those through those gating questions. Okay. So can, can we just walk you through to the sort of the second part of it to sort of say just to clarify? So suppose you have a licensed performance obligation and another performance obligation, but you have a single form consideration which is sort of sales based, royalty based. Uh, I, I think if I've if I've put all the way through there, um, then I think I have an allocation question. Um, it's that sounds quite tough, I think, for preparers. Um, it's pretty tough for auditors, and maybe the gating questions and the ability to attribute variable consideration to a single performance obligation in some circumstances limit the number of occasions I have to deal with that question but if I get to that question I'm probably on the uncomfortable answer. Mary. Um, Brian, if I could just follow up on your you gave yourself a B plus grade I don't know if it's B minus if you're slipping uh, down to <laughs> between a B and a C um, but um, when, when I look at C and the reminder it has of the requirement in the standard when considering the nature of the performance obligation if you do not have if you conclude that something is not distinct a distinct performance obligation from the um, uh, license of intellectual property you, you're then directed when considering the nature of the performance obligation to assess what is the the dominant characteristic and and what I took from what you were saying is you would not apply that guidance in your consideration in answering this question, you'd rather have a, a different test that set a tighter threshold for the significance of the non, you know, for how, how you assess the role. And I guess, what is it that leads you to look for another test rather than the test that's in the standard if you're looking at it under approach C? Um, I think it's probably the placement it, it, it's geography. Um, mm -hmm. It's the placement of the royalties exception um, in the standard in the discussion of um, of just um, licences and the fact, as, as I say, that BC 407 um, is, is, is there in the basis. I think it informs my um, ability to incorporate kind of small things, but it's not for me changing the scope of the exception from distinct to primary or dominant. As I, I, <coughs> I'm explaining how I think the standard hangs together. Um, I, I'm not sure it's a very attractive answer, and I'm very interested in understanding how often we'll actually get to it once we work through things like the gating question as to what's the nature of the arrangement, once we've thought deeply about what's the nature of intellectual property, and of course if the license is transferring over time, yeah. maybe it doesn't matter because your best measure of progress is sales or usage in any case. And also the other point you raised, which is the, the paragraph 85 allocation, 
which might at least take some of the tension out in the sense of actually the sales base already consideration or get to the license performance obligation anyway when you do the allocation. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so I'm feeling um, maybe a little bit purist, but I'm, I don't really have a feel for how often <coughs> that's going to be the practical answer because I think there are a whole range of other things to consider in deciding how to account for this type of arrangement. Okay. Tony. Um, I guess my, I echo some of the things that, that, that Brian said about the need to understand the nature of the arrangement, to understand the nature of the intellectual property, and to understand the nature of any other promises that go with it, distinct or not. And I sense that one of the, the one of the reasons for the questions being raised in the paper goes back to the fact that this is an exception, and by their nature, exceptions create a tension because if they are not very very tightly scoped, then there is always a risk that people will look at it very closely and say, you know, either I'm in or or, or I'm not. And I think some of that. Some of that tension comes through here, and I think there are perhaps a couple of other questions that, that will potentially come out of, of, of this particular exception, such as you know, what's a license, what's, what's a sales-based royalty, um, because those aren't defined terms in the standard either. Um, I think my, um, my sense of, of looking at what Paragraph B63 says and where it sits in the um, in the application guidance, uh, taken together with uh, what's said in the basis for conclusions, implies that the board's intended a very narrow um, exception, uh, and that might lead you towards um, uh, uh, interpretation B, which is where I think um, Brian ended up. I just, I just wonder if there is a tension because B63 is not absolutely explicit about that and doesn't say that it applies um, when a um, sales usage based royalty is promised solely in exchange for a license. And if that's the case, you think, well, then perhaps the guidance is not being applied by analogy. We're actually saying the sales or usage-based royalty was applied, given in exchange for a license and some other things. So I think I, 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 I can see a tension between what seems to me to come through from the basis for conclusions and what was actually written in paragraph 63 of the application guidance. Um, I take Brian's point entirely that there may be limited circumstances where um, this becomes relevant if it turns out to be a license over time and and so forth. It may just not be something that that does create um, attention, but or it doesn't create attention very often. But I think I can I can see why people might look at what's in B63 and what's in the basis for conclusions and perhaps not see it um, as being entirely consistent. Um, I think to the point about, about where I would go on on question two, um, I think I'd echo a lot of what Brian said, that you think about the basis on which you would do the allocation. Is there a basis to allocate all the variability to one component? And so it may not be an issue um, all that often. Um, but I do also wonder, and I know the boards have addressed it in the basis for conclusions, but if you did end up with um, having to make an allocation and then you'd be saying, well, half of the consideration, it's relevant to measure and recognize half of the consideration in an arrangement. It's not relevant to recognize and measure the other half. And I just wonder if that in and of itself creates a tension. And I know that the board explained that in the where they got to in the basis, but I still think it's um, an observation. I mean, you're right. I mean, you know, you, you put an exception and therefore you sort of create all of these questions around the scope and all of the terms that go into mm -hmm. defining that scope. But that tension that you you know you highlight there in the end in a single contract kind of exists if you have two separate contracts, one of which is not IP but has a similar form of 
configuration, obviously when it's IP yeah. with with sales based royalties. So, but um, it's uh, it's challenging. Is a question for Tony. So here we have an example with two activities, which are one single performance obligation. If the example <coughs> was one performance obligation with of IP uh, royalties with a fixed upfront, what would be the, your answer? Do you think that the exception should not apply either? So the arrangement is one in which there is a fixed fee together with a variable fee. Um, I, I would be um, inclined to um, look again and say that the, the, the way that B63 is worded doesn't specifically say that you don't apply it in that circumstance. Remember, that would be you, your transaction price, price in that situation contains the fixed and the, and the variable piece. Yeah. So that's determined by the transaction price. But say you've satisfied the performance obligation, let's say up front because it was a yeah. license it was the right. But then then you've got yes, you've got to apply then that wording in B sixty three. And you know, one way of reading it would say, well, I can't recognise the revenue for the sales based piece or usage based piece until the sales based royalties occur. But that wouldn't necessarily preclude recognising the fixed bit well, of the transaction. I think that's where I would get to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, originally it's leading toward interpretation C uh, because uh, I thought that is a kind of natural. Interpret not just interpretation, or interpretation <coughs> based on this exception. I understand uh, the board trying to limit that exception, so it um, could be lead to the interpretation B, but I think that is too uh, narrow and ends up we might need to follow up the following years to remeasure. The revenue uh, consideration. I think the intention is to make it more simple and uh, relevant uh, to the users. So in order to achieve that, that exception is uh, introduced, which is, I think, is uh, as long as the revenue is based on sales or uh, timing. Um, I think it's counterintuitive. So. That's the basis. And I thought that is originally we should distinct uh, that portion or additional service should be distinct. If I look at the examples that prepared, like uh, franchise uh, revenue for 10 years and additional service, so this should be distinct, but somehow it's not. Then we don't want to make it complicated. <laughs> we just uh, look at the uh, contract and then issues and then how we depict the business better than anywhere else. So in that sense, focus on primary <coughs> the way I think we should do. Okay, thank you, James. Actually, my point is exactly the same one in the sense I do feel nervous when one actually gets to uh, interpretations that have to emphasize only and solely in the sense that I have a fear they verge on the degree of pedantry rather than the practicality of interpretation or intent. And it seemed to me that C, admittedly having to be reasonably tightly um, viewed, was a much more effective um, and realistic interpretation of, in my mind, what I would have assumed the board's objective was, um, rather than going down a solely and only approach which then starts to have quite, uh, or could have, um, significant implications where one has to go into the, the detail of a contract uh, in terms of nuances that may also be there that aren't, that just blur that solely or only. So it does seem to me that, I mean, I suppose I'm, I'm where Brian is or a bit further towards C, and it does seem to me getting too stuck on solely and only is always dangerous. Okay, any further comments? We seem to be somewhere between B and C.
And uh, we've also covered Christian too to some extent. So, Jim, over to you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Alan? Yeah. So I, I, I think the, uh, the license guidance in general is extremely difficult to apply. I think uh, the, uh, I'm a little bit confused about the scope of this question. And I say that uh, because one of the examples given for whether or not to apply the royalty constraint is actually a movie example. And the example is that a studio will produce a movie, license that movie to the theaters, and also has an obligation to do advertising. And in that case, the question is, do you have to, and the license between the studio and the movie theater is all royalty based. It's a revenue share. So do you have to, I guess the question really is, bifurcate some portion of that revenue share to say that, or, or maybe you're not in the royalty constraint because you have to do that advertising. Well, I, I thought that was the original question, or one of the original questions, why we put the royalty constraint in place. Because if you take the simple example, we might uh, come out with, and just to give one example, Despicable Me Too, uh, on December 25th. The movie will do roughly, or did, $800 million in worldwide box office. Let's just say our take is half of that. So we would recognize $400 million, but that would be over time, over a three-month period, in essence, that the movie is in the theaters. And so we all struggled with, should we recognize $400 million in the fourth quarter of the year, or should we recognize the $400 million over time as the customers are going to see the movie in the theaters? And we said, because there is... Um, some form of profit sharing taking place that the revenue would be subject to this royalty constraint and therefore revenue would be recognized over time as the customers came in to see the movie. Well, in, in all these cases, the advertising component is roughly $300 million or, or could be even $400 million. So it is a very significant component Without the advertising, very little revenue would come in under the revenue share. So doesn't this bring us back to the original question about should, should a company apply the royalty constraint or what is the purpose of the royalty constraint to start off with? So I, I, I was confused even about the example. If, if we're talking about uh, whether it's two performance obligations – or one performance obligation, but there are two revenue streams, uh, I understood that question from uh, the question that's being asked here. Does the royalty constraint apply if you have a service as well as a license taking place? Two revenue streams. Here you have one revenue stream, but there's a cost that you're expending uh, as it relates to getting that revenue share or royalty license. And, and technically, isn't that almost in every case where you have uh, this royalty constraint where there's some other activity that's also going on outside the, uh, the arrangement to also garner the, the revenue as well? So, I, again, I don't know if any of the board wants to have any comments. I, I was confused about the example. Was that the question that we were worried about, or was it the questions in paragraph six? Uh, well, let, let me just try and clarify two things. Uh, very intentionally, I would say, on the staff's part, there is not an intention in paragraph 23 that talked about instances where you might, depending on the facts and circumstances, determine that the license could be considered the primary or dominant component to which the royalty relates. And 
any intention to conclude in those scenarios whether there was one or multiple performance obligations. We did not want to conclude on what is, again, a facts and circumstances based issue that's not part of this paper. So what this is, is going to, you know, Alan's keyed on C in that paragraph. What we're, what we're trying to point out is that some stakeholders have suggested that when, in this scenario, we would conclude that I have promised you as the movie theater that I am going to perform specific advertising in your area. So it could be construed as a promised good or service in the contract. And, of course, I'm transferring a license for you to show the movie for, be it three months or six weeks or whatever the period of time is. If you were to conclude that the royalty, the amount of royalties that you're going to earn and the amount of royalties, you know, the, the fee that the movie theater is going to keep uh, are both a consequence of the movie itself and the advertising that you perform, the question is in that scenario, should you apply the royalties constraint if it's not just me giving you a license to the movie and not doing any advertising? And this is where the, the, the issue of you know, issue one really comes in is that it would seem that interpretation B in that example would tell you, well, no, the royalty applies to two things, so the royalties constraint wouldn't apply. Interpretation C, as we've laid it out in here, might say that if the license, if you conclude that from the customer's perspective, for example, the license is the primary or dominant piece of this ar arrangement, you could apply the royalties constraint. And that's sort of the tension we were trying to show is the, those various interpretations and uh, without really touching on separate performance obligation or the core overtime versus point-in-time licenses guidance. Do you have to do the advertising? We agree, we agree to do advertising. It's the amount of advertising that will vary by movie. Uh, but the amount of revenue that we will garner is solely right directly directly yeah, correlated to the amount of advertising and so it's it, it it's hard to bifurcate the license from the amount of advertising we will do so if you think about it too i guess one of the reasons was sort of the practicality of having to determine the entire royalty on december 25th when it evidences itself in your case over three months and if you said well you have to do it anyway but then you just take 20 percent because 20 percent of the royalty relates to the advertising you say well why am I not just booking the whole thing and it, it's just an oddity of accounting for the single royalty stream under two different models I, I, if that was the approach Ka Ka Alan how do you how do you account for the costs of the advertising is that is that capitalized and deferred and brought in as the revenue is earned or how does how does that work that's ex expensed as incurred uh, I'd say 70 percent of it will happen before the theatrical release of the movie and then 30 percent throughout and if the movie is doing pretty good there'll be a little bit more but for the most part it's 70 percent before and 30 percent uh, after So I should start first with a disclaimer that I have never accounted for royalties in my entire career. <laughs> but what I, I, it would seem to me when I look at this, when I look at view B, that's going to end up with a result where there is no diversity in practice, pretty straightforward to apply. I think the window to view C, is, as a number of people have noted, comes through BC 407. And I, I'm sympathetic to that view because I think if one of our objectives in financial reporting is to be able to compare relative performance, you're getting, if, if you take view C, you're not as focused on, on form over substance, if you like. So as I say, just a philosophical comment. So, so you said B was easiest to apply, and I would have thought the outcome of B was the hardest. To, to apply because now you have to account for a s potentially a single royalty under two different accounting models. Just let me, you're, you're, that's kind of taking the two questions and putting them together. B would result in the, practically would result in the least number of cases where you would conclude that the entire royalty would get accounted for under the constraint. Question two is then, as 
the staff are sick of hearing me say is the question of whether you split the baby and whether you take a portion of the royalty once you've decided that it doesn't apply to the entire thing. And that's where the complexity, I think, that you're thinking about could come in is if you have to take a single royalty stream and do half of it under the royalties constraint and another portion under the other type. Theoretically, uh, you could conclude that you... But, even in but that's, the, all, that's the practical outcome of B. Yeah, and the whole, I thought the whole reason we came up with this was because it was too difficult to determine the amount. So, so how would you yeah. end up, if it's too difficult to do it, which is the basis for why we have this, why would you go to B? Because you can't figure out the whole to split it. If the reason you came up with this was because it's too difficult to do it, why does it only apply to licenses and not sales? Why does it only apply to intangibles and not tangibles? Th th this is the problem, as some have pointed out, with creating the exception. I got to say, I read the basis to say you guys wanted the exception applied very narrowly. It says, for example, the restriction would not apply to tangible goods that include a significant amount of intellectual property. That sentence is in the basis. I thought it said B, that view B is, is the answer. Because the board said view C doesn't, it doesn't do it, and view A doesn't do it. I don't like that. I mean, I happen to think it is too difficult to, to estimate these amounts, and I'd apply it a heck of a lot more broadly. But as Jim told us, we're not supposed to complain about the answer. We're just supposed to talk about whether we know what the answer is. I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I read that sentence in the basis. Maybe I'm taking it for too much. It's only in the basis, and there's, you know, there's lots of stuff in the basis about things that were discussed and rejected, but this one actually seems clear. The restriction would not apply to tangible goods that include a significant amount of intellectual property. That seems to push me to be. Um, now, issue two, a different question about splitting the royalty, but, uh, you know, I, act I actually thought that, you know, as written, you guys made an exception. You, you didn't, you, you looked for, considered whether it should be a principle-based exception. You thought about it, but decided no. I, I might be wrong, but I think uh, one, one I of the if reasons... Christoph could just get... If I could just finish, Christoph, I think one of the reasons for, for that sentence and the basis was we didn't want anybody to think that automobile sales, because of the amount of intellectual property in that, you know, would be scoped into that. Right, and so you could argue, you know, the sentence says that we didn't want it to apply to tangible goods that include a significant amount. I, I suppose maybe you did want it to apply to a tangible good that included a dominant amount of intellectual property, but I, I have trouble figuring, figuring out that that could have been, you know, what the line is. But, but I, if but so, I great. I don't think that that's the way B is written, because the way I was reading B was if I wanted to avoid the royalty exception uh, treatment, all I would have to do is pair it with some amount of uh, non-licensed non good or service. Uh -huh. Seems like that'd be pretty easy to do. I agree. <laughs> I, that, and that, that's, just, that's the way I thought it was written. I, I'll be happy to find out that's not what's meant, believe me. Christoph, do you mean? Yeah, I think it was very similar to what Scott. I would be interested to understand those who are in favor of UC, whether they would make a distinction on whether the license is sold with a tangible good or other intangible goods or services, or whether they would simply ignore um, the clear statement in the basis that it should not apply to a tangible good, so if this is license. And if we finally go for saying, no, no, if it's sold with a tangible good, then we don't apply it. But if it's sold like with advertising, intangibles or services, we apply it. I don't think that this makes uh, Pew C easier to apply than Pew B. Allison. Thanks, Jim. So we debated this issue quite a bit. And I, th I think it's safe to say that our group was fairly split amongst the different alternatives. You know, there are some that thought, okay, view A ought to apply because there's nothing in the standard itself that it has to apply solely to only a license of intellectual property with no other goods and services attached. So the wording isn't clear that you have to do anything other than view A. Some thought, okay, view B is appropriate because it is an exception. Exceptions should be applied narrowly. 
And as some have pointed out, there might be some wording in the basis for conclusions that point you that way. But then the more we thought about view B and then thought, okay, well, how would you apply that, which brings you into issue two, I don't think anybody in our group thought that it would make sense to take a dollar of royalty and potentially split it into different components and potentially recognize some of that um, following the existing model for variable consideration and the constraint and have some portion of that royalty not be recognized because of the constraint or the specific exception. Nobody thought that that made any sense. So that would tell us that view B would suggest that you'd have very small numbers of instances when the exception would apply. We weren't really sure that that was consistent with the board's intent either, because if that was the case, why provide the exception? And the whole point, I thought, was to simplify and make financial statement information more relevant to users. I think that we did have, we also had a debate about the, about view C and thought that conceptually, maybe that is where this particular issue ought to head in terms of direction. But no, nobody thinks that the words in the standard today tell you that you need to think about it that way because it is characterized as an exception and that additional guidance would likely be needed to help companies be able to make more consistent judgments about what does it mean to be predominant. Mark, then Russell. Yeah, I, 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 Allison probably just sort of said where, where we were in, in the camp. I guess when we looked at this, understanding what's in the basis for conclusion that we, in you know, being at the meetings, we understood that the, the board's intent was to narrow this this exception um, to only those items that uh, you, you know that really thought they applied, but we thought the intent was interpretation A. Um, notwithstanding that, we certainly understand what's in the basis for conclusion, and that that might point you towards uh, B. But we thought um, the l line drawn on this license of intellectual property was mainly because those licenses are are the, the cost are very minimal and versus a tangible good where you give away a good and you have the cost that you have to expense when you give away the goods, so therefore they didn't want to constrain it to those. But we always thought that um, view A was sort of where they, they landed, but then reading this we obviously understand. Uh, and there was diverse views within our, our group. Um, some were very strong, view A and, and others, um, you know, were looking to view C. And then there was a, you know, Obviously, you don't want someone to just throw the word license into an arrangement and suddenly get the royalty treatment if that's what it is. So sort of an A plus would have been, you know, if the license is not non-substantive or, or not significant, of course, that, you know, that wouldn't, wouldn't apply. But that's where we were. I think what this does, though, is it puts a lot of focus on all the other stuff I think that Alan's talking about. You know, is the license separate from the other? It, you know, puts step two is not exactly clear when you would have separation and when you wouldn't. And then the license guidance itself on when you would be over time or point in time, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on that. And I think even if you apply this and you're over and you, you end up uh, you know, recognizing the sales based royalties over time, to the extent a lot of these um, arrangements have guaranteed minimum royalties. So you still have to make sure you understand whether it's point in time or over time, because if it's point in time and you have these guaranteed minimums, the way I understand it is you would end up recognizing the minimums immediately and then the royalties would somehow kick in later and we have questions about that. So I think there's all kinds of things around licenses other than this. I presume they're going to come back, but uh, in this we thought the, in, the overall the intent was, was interpretation A, but um, if you land on B, I think uh, it does put a lot more pressure on, pressure on the second question, obviously. Mark and Allison, on, an, on interpretation A, putting aside a fact pattern where someone just writes in a, a license when there's not one. So put, putting that aside, would you think that the outcome of interpretation A would mean that in a substantial majority of cases you would not, uh, you, you would fall into applying the exception? Be because it would be probably be easy to argue that for a lot of sales of product there is an embedded piece of IP. Not all, but a lot. No, I, I thought the, I, I mean, it's a license of intellectual property. It, 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 you get into, you know, what is a, a license and, you know, what is intellectual property is a, you know, in the typical software as a service arrangements where it's usage based. Well, I don't know whether there's a license in there. You're hosting a, a, um, a soft, you're hosting the software. Is there a license in there? I guess that gets into, the, that's why I was saying before you even get to this, you got to determine whether or not there's a, a license in, in the arrangement of intellectual property. Um, and uh, that's not defined in the standard, so um, that's that's where the the focus will be. It won't be necessarily on this. If a prop, no, I, I was just going to say 
maybe it's because we're approaching these questions thinking you've got a license of intellectual property and you've got other stuff with it versus we're selling a tangible good that may also include a license agreement as part of the purchase of that piece of, of, of tangible goods. I think it, um, I think because, you know, at least at this stage, we approach a lot of these questions thinking about it in terms of licenses. That's why people, I think, sometimes head down the view C path and think, well, predominantly, if what you think you're really dealing with here is a license of intellectual property, there may be other activities that are significant and important. But if what you're really focused, the focus of, of the reason why the arrangement exists in the first place is because of the license of intellectual property, um, I think that that's probably how I would be thinking down a path towards answering the question that you raised. If someone came to me and said, okay, we're selling a tangible good and we've got this license of intellectual property attached to it and they're both very significant, we would have a, you know, a good debate about whether view A um, would end up applying. And then maybe, again, as I just mentioned, maybe we would naturally head down a view C path. But, but my judgments and thoughts on that might not be consistent with anybody else's on that particular view. So that's where the concern about applying view C would come up. Maybe it gets back to your point of what exactly is intellectual property, but it, it would seem to me if, if you purchase, let's say, a copy machine and there was software that was allowing you to do all the things you do with a copy machine, that you you are getting a license to that software. We, we can argue if it's IP that's in the scope of this, but you are actually getting software in that. So, that, so that's why I'm saying it seems to me that under interpretation A, the concern is that that would go pretty far. I mean, you sell a smartphone and it's got intellectual Anything. property all like in it. You basic, sign a license agreement calculator. when you purchase that that smartphone. There's no royalty. But there may not be in those fa in, the, well, in that fact pattern. But it's just a question of the, the copier example. You might have it. Well, just to answer your questions, I mean, think about a, a, a large, you know, a multifunction copier where you also sign an end user license agreement for the software that is embedded on the machine, and then you pay a production type charge based on number of copies, and That's that would be a usage based rather than sales based royalty. And that in you know the interpretation as as we understood, a you could argue that the fact that you have what I would say is a significant license. The copier doesn't function without that software, but I think you could also easily argue it's not the dominant feature because of all the mechanics involved. W interpretation A would likely take you to a the royalties exception, and interpretation C may not, and interpretation B clearly would not. And For, for examples of this, Russ, the gentleman with his card up may have some... <laughs> We can't, we can't hear anything at this right. end. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I was just thinking of an example that would, would put a lot of pressure on this question that uh, we could debate, which is one we thought about a number of years ago when we adopted 0021. And it, think of an, I, an IT company goes in and builds a payroll processing system um, for, for a company and, just, and agrees to a 10-year service contract to manage the the processing system for 10 years and just gets paid on a transactional basis, so based on the number of payroll transactions that are processed. company has 30 years of, ex of experience with the same static level of employees, pretty reasonable that you can estimate the number of uh, the consideration that you're going to get over the 10-year period. There's termination provisions built in if you – if if for whatever reason the, the contract were terminated, you would recover your, your cost of the IT system and, and a reasonable profit margin, let's say. So the IT system obviously has a lot of intellectual property, has a lot of, a lot, it's pro probably predominantly software and licenses, but, there's, but it's a solution from the customer's perspective, and it has a lot of hardware and integration effort, that sort of thing. So. How would we how would we think about that? I in in that example, the conclusion under 0021 was that contingent revenue provisions because it's contingent on the delivery of the ongoing management of this of of the system that you would defer and have to defer the revenue. But a lot of people thought that didn't make sense and was I thought a, a part of why we went a different direction with this proposed standard or the the new standard. That you know, in that in that example, if people felt like there, 
there should be. There was there there was an economic event that took place, and revenue should be recognized with the IT system. So, um, I don't know where that would 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 put me necessarily, but probably somewhere between B and C, like most other people. But um, again, no real concerns about being able to estimate that. Why wouldn't you recognize revenue for the IT system? Greg and Tom. Just one comment on, on Russ's example. So we do that a lot. I mean, maybe not apparel systems, but there's really no transfer of a license in those arrangements, right? So the company builds up accumulated IP to design a service for entities. But in the case of when you build a payroll system, unless you're going to, uh, there's never, you're going to provide that service on a day by day or week by week basis. There's really no license <coughs> that gets conveyed to the IP because we retain the IP. We may use the IP that to build a payroll service for Jim. The next week, we'll build one for Mary. So in that particular case, I wouldn't look at that as a, as a license that generates a royalty based stream. So maybe that was a bad assumption. Well, I mean, just just to because yeah. Russ and I were kind of asking the same question: Where is there really a license there? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would say in our case, there's not. In those examples, Greg, is it clear to you whether there is a, a sales or usage-based royalty? I know there's a royalty, but in, in typical IT outsourcing cases, we look at it as providing a service, day to day or month to month or year to year, not a transfer of a intellectual property. So you're paid based on. Based on based on usage, based on MIPS provided, based on calls answered, if you're running if you're running a help desk, uh, you know, contrasting that to where you build a computer that has a significant amount of IP in the development of the server, and then you sell the server with an operating system which also has uh, uh, so that's software. So when a client buys a server that has an operating system on it, they get possession of the tangible good, but they also sign a license for the software, right? So they can't deconstruct the protect our rights, they can't deconstruct. Now that license is not a royalty-based license in that particular example, it's just a you know, license that goes along with the sale of the tangible good. I'm Jim, a little uncomfortable like to that we're even. has got comments on two, question two. Just, I, just one second, I think Tom, Tom wanted to, to get in here. I'm a little uncomfortable that we're even talking about interpretation C. Because I don't see how any words in this document right. could get to a predominantly view. And I thought we weren't here to re-deliberate issues um, and to make it work for licenses. We were there to look for operability concerns. And I could see A or B. I could see the exception being there in a sense to say if it's a tied to a practicability exception and applying the constraint, that is, when there's variable consideration, regardless of whether it's a point in time or over time thing, we would always apply the constraint when there is sales or, or usage-based royalties. Or I could see B, if it's really trying to help us as a practicability exception, deal with whether it's point in time or over time, uh, that we're not going to make that judgment and therefore we're going to just do B all the time. But C seems to me to be redeliberating, and I'm just not comfortable that we're going to, that we start redeliberating the conclusions, because uh, I think we'll endlessly do that on licenses as we go forward. Ian, back to you. I just wanted to check if anybody's got any comments on question two. We had a lot of discussion on question one. Anything further on that? No, no comments here, Jim. What about your end? Russ? Sorry, I want to go back to question one. I, I, I had, well, it gets to the term royalty. And, and what, what Russ described, I would not, even if it was a license, I wouldn't have had in my head it was a royalty. I, I had thought, and maybe I wasn't thinking about this, was that this was based on your customer's customer. So your customer's customer, in, in Alan's situation, he gives the intellectual license to the theater. The theater doesn't get paid until I go see Despicable Me w with my son. Uh, <laughs> and, and you don't get paid until that. A usage could be is I've given the intellectual capital 
to, uh, to, 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 to Russ to put in his products that he's going to subsequently sell, and I only get paid when you subsequently sell it. It wasn't the uh, it wasn't the payroll where I've performed the service, and I'm just collecting money um, as as in a pure variable amount. So I always thought this was based on the customer's customer because I remember when we had the workshop, it was all about the concept of a partnership. We had we had arranged these arrangements in the form of a partnership. But I just want to make sure that's what people believe when we say royalty. Uh, okay. So then I get back to the one about the selling of the product. When, when is a scenario when I actually sell a license and a product that is then resold and I only get paid upon resale? And people would think I would get revenue on that. Just an example. Well, I, I guess, Russ, I, I, uh, from, from our perspective, writing this, I think what you described was the sales-based royalty, but I'm not sure it always involves a third party for a usage-based royalty. Because if I sell the, again, the multifunction copier to you, uh, and then I'm going to get paid based on how many copies you make, that might, at the end of the day, have a function. If you're Kinko's, right, how many of your customers come in and need copies from you? Maybe it involves a third party, but you also might just use that copier for your internal purposes that don't involve an end customer, but yet still my payment is a usage-based royalty. So I guess so, so, I, I haven't thought it necessarily requires a third party. So Okay, so in the example where I sell my license to, to Russell... And he uses that license in his locomotives to sell it. And I only get paid when he delivers the locomotives. You're saying that's a sales base. That's not a usage base. Well, yes. In my mind, if you're putting your IP into a product and then it's the sale of the product, that's a sales-based royalty. I... That's not covered by the exception in your mind? Oh, I, don't, I was just trying to describe the scenario. I, I don't think I was. No, no, that, that, that would be. Um, so then, so then, so then, in your mind, under a usage base, anything that is subject. So in that example where there was a license, that would, in your mind, be be applied. So, uh, so we well, not necessarily. I had the same. Qu sorry, go ahead. The, then the term royalty is non-distinct. It should just say sales based and usage and usage based, based fees, not yeah. royalties. So that the the term royalty is. Because I think what Russ is saying, royalty means third-party. I thought royalty third mattered. And You're royalty saying royalty doesn't matter. That's okay. I just... Okay. If there's nothing further there, I think we're just about done on this topic. Jim, do you think? I think so. Okay. Well, thank you. Can we move on then to... Um, Paper number four, and uh, Raghava is going to tee it up for us, I think. Yep. Uh, the potential implementation issue in this paper is about the requirement and the standard that an entity should use the principles for determining the transaction price for ascertaining the future cash flows for impairment testing of capitalized contract costs. So the issue is, does the use of principles for determining transaction price mean that an entity cannot consider expected cash flows during contract renewal or extension periods, essentially because the standard for the purpose of measuring transaction price for revenue recognition prohibits an entity from assuming extensions and renewals. Now, the staff is aware of two views. One view is that the requirement is looked at narrowly as to restrict the entity from assuming any renewals and extensions, even for impairment testing purposes, which means that the entity may have to immediately impair the asset to the extent the asset is not recoverable. The other view is that the standard sets out the boundary for impairment testing by requiring an entity to consider the goods and services to which the asset relates. And if the asset relates to the goods and services to be transferred during the renewal period, then the entity will essentially consider the expected future cash flows during the renewal periods as well for impairment testing purposes. The basis for conclusions as well state that the objective for impairment testing is essentially different from the objective for measurement of revenue for revenue recognition purposes. <laughs>
So now over to the TRG members as to what are your views about the potential implementation issue <laughs> and are you aware of any other interpretations um, on this issue which are not included in this paper and any other related issues that you're aware of? You want to take it over there first, Jim? Sure. Perspectives here. Mark, Mark, or Allison, I guess she beat you to it, Mark, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to have the same view as her. <laughs> Just. <laughs> we thought view two. Mark? Same? <laughs> uh, we're view two. That would have been funny if you had been view one after. Yeah. I, 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 we just always assumed that was it. I, when, when you read the words, I guess you could potentially get the view one, but I, that just doesn't make any sense at all to us. Others here? See General Head, see, see General Head nodding here, Ian. Okay, thank you. Views here? Andrew. Um, I'll, I'll just agree with everyone else, uh, also view two. I think that if you look at the wording that appears contradictory, you could also read it to say that you need to be consistent during the period that has been used for the purposes of revenue recognition. And therefore, for the contractual period you've got, when you're looking at impairment, during that period your revenue assumptions need to be consistent. It's just when you're doing impairment you extend for a further period. Um, I, I didn't have a particular problem getting to view two very quickly, though. Okay. J James, you... I agree entirely. It seemed to me to be clear from the words that was the intent. Gosh. Brian? <coughs> Similarly, I was on view two. I just had one other observation. Um, I think this is the shortest impairment test I've seen in any accounting standards, so my compliments for that. <laughs> <laughs> Can we find somebody who disagrees? <laughs> you too. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, we have one uh, card up here. Yep. Russell? Yeah, I, I, I agree with, um, with, with this view too. Um, one, one question that, that I have, if we're, if we're going to clarify this, this, this guidance, I'd like to maybe think about expanding it a little bit. The, the, the guidance that that the contract or transaction price should assume that the contract wouldn't be canceled, renewed, or modified, I think has some other implications that I'm, I'm concerned about, in, in particular how it interacts with variable consideration and the constraint. So I'm thinking about a, a long-term contract that's accounted for over time where you've You've got a contract asset that that's developed because you've, your revenues exceeded your your billings, um, and and just concerned about sort of the interaction of of this this literature here. You know, part of part of me says, do you, do you want to fat? You, you you could just model in the contract the existing terms of the contract through the end of the contract. But if there's concerns about termination. Or if there's concerns about modifications that come in the form of price reductions, such that you wouldn't recover your contract asset, wouldn't you want to consider that? And couldn't you consider that as part of, part of your variable consideration determinations, or maybe the constraint? But I'm concerned that the guidance that says you shouldn't consider cancellations or renewals or modifications when you come up with your trans trans transaction price would would conflict with the idea of, of doing that. So I, I'd like to see, and I can provide some, some examples if it would be helpful, but I'd, I'd like, if we're going to, if we're going to make some clarifications in this area, that's one clarification that I would like to see as well. I think okay. be, and it might be so helpful if you could questions? provide that to the staff with just a couple of those examples. Sure. Sure. Thanks. I'm just James. curious, I mean, it may not be the moment, but I just wonder, I mean, if, if the view was so clear on what we've got, whether there is need for more clarifications, I mean, on the basis that one's trying to avoid lengthening rather than um, anything else, the, the amount of uh, clarification work here. I mean, it's 
would seem to me we got to a pretty unanimous view of what the view was. So whether one actually wants to have clarifications to, for things that are pretty clear, I wonder. Yeah. Uh, the question is, it seems to be there is a consensus among preparers, auditors, users. The question I would ask is there any board member who doesn't feel comfortable on this side of the Atlantic with this conclusion? Personally, I don't. Uh, so you, you feel comfortable? I am comfortable. So, uh, I mean, the, if everyone is comfortable, including board members, then probably there is sufficient consensus so that we don't need to uh, issue anything. I think that's where we're heading. I don't know. Jim, any further final comments from your end? Anything else on this, Jay? I don't have anything more on this issue, but before we wrap up, I'd like to just pose a couple more questions about the, the, the output after this, but uh, nothing more on this issue. Okay, well, I think we have a complete issue. I wish they were all as easy as that. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you might, you've got a question over there on, on process and whatnot. You might like to take that forward, and then we could open up the same sort of questions here. Okay. Just a, a, a general question. When you described uh, up front the, uh, the next steps, um, and I realize this is a piece of clay that you're try trying to figure it out, and you've got a long ways to go, especially with this, this first one, do you, do you think it's possible that you'll have something relative to uh, um, um, whatever you're going to prepare as a result of this by the time of our next meeting in October so that you might gather some reaction from the, the group, uh, um, even if it's preliminary at, at, at that point? Because I, I made a suggestion that would be very helpful if, if there was something for us to react to before the next, uh, next meeting. That's what we hope to do. Um, now, sometimes that reaction at the – or update at the next meeting might be a status update, meaning we don't have anything to tell you, but it's still in, in play. But we, we do hope to be able to come back after each meeting at the beginning or end or sometime during that meeting or perhaps even before, say, here's what we heard and here's the intended steps, either no action or it continues to be an issue or we think there's education needed, but we do want to update the group. Just one other uh, question. I know you mentioned this at the, at the beginning, and I, I don't know how it's going to be become transparent on what the issues are that are on this committee. But I, I, I think as transparent as you can be as to what's I know I don't know whether you go as far as what the EITF does, and there's some kind of agenda, a formal something published. But we get the question, or I don't I, I get the question, and, and I know my colleagues do, um, and I'm sure the other firms at least, and, and maybe others are getting. What's on this committee's agenda? What are they considering? What have they? What issues have gone there that have been rejected? I, I don't know how we do that, but somehow we got to be able to let people know that this this issue was discussed and nothing was changed, or this uh, issue was brought forth and it was never put on the agenda. And I think that that latter part is is important because if someone's expecting this committee to take care of something in the future, but it's already been rejected, that needs to be. No, so I don't know how we do that, um, but I know it's a question I get all the time. I, you know, we've been talking about that internally as well, and we're still sorting out some of the details. But I think, at a, at a minimum, from a committee's perspective, we do plan from time to time to to let you know what issues are in the pipeline, if you will, for future meetings, so that you can start to think about them. Um, but I will use the opportunity to say that, you know, we really haven't had a significant volume of submissions, not that we're necessarily asking for a volume of submissions, but, you know, we haven't really had a lot of issues heretofore, but that certainly will become something that we'll need to think about as we progress. We'll be happy to help with that. And what, so, so uh, with that in mind, one of the difficulties, I think, uh, transparency, you're right, Mark, is, is important, but there may be issues submitted that the staff looks through and says this is maybe a less sophisticated um, submitter of the issue in terms of having gone through the detailed standard. I think Colin described that as potentially saying, hey, we're, help we're happy to take that in terms of pointing people to, you know, paragraph, you know, whatever is directly on point, and we, we don't want to um, – 
stifle people sending those types of issues if we can be helpful, but then them thinking it gets reported up to, to some other level. So I think there will be some level of, uh, of us saying this wasn't really even an interpretive issue. There were things directly on point. So we're sorting through how do we best provide that transparency. And just, and just to be clear, I, you know, I think it's just to be fair to everyone that's not on this committee, um, making sure that they know. I mean, I, I, making it confidential amongst us is probably not ideal because then they'll call and somehow it's like, oh, well, here's what's on there, and I'm not really supposed to tell you. But I, I, to make it just, in my mind, transparent for everyone, to be fair to every other entity and company and firm that's not on this committee, what's being, I don't know how you do that. I know it's a, I know it's a big task. But And if you are the submitter of an issue, I think there's, you know, whether it makes it up or not, or it's one the staff can say, look, this is sort of directly addressed already, there will be direct you know, it's not like they're going to go into a black box. The, the staff will work directly with the submitter. Yeah, okay. I, I think Mark makes a very good point, and I think we need to be as open and as transparent as we can be. And, and we're going to work together to uh, work out how to do that. Are there any questions at this end or comments that people would like to make? Ian, can I just confirm an understanding in terms of... Um, clarifying what people who are observing the meeting may walk away with. I had assumed, but want to check that the papers for today's meeting, not just the agenda, but the papers supporting the agenda, were posted and publicly available? Yes, they are. That's correct. So, so Mark, in terms of your issues, somebody could see what's scheduled to be discussed, could observe the meeting. I think the, the question is about the reporting what followed up action and if that's in the public meeting that that will also be in the the public domain and the question really is about the the pipeline that has not made it to the <coughs> agenda for the next meeting yes. and so it'll be well, what we're sitting with in inventory when we publish things, things that have been rejected <laughs> as well yeah. i mean it's a, it's a well, good point yeah and I, and I think as i said at the outset um, as sue mentioned you know, that, that's something that we want to yeah. develop is some way of reporting. Uh, so then that gives transparency to you know, mm -hmm. the issues that have not been dealt with that have come in and also the issues that we're not actually going to sort of particularly do anything with. Yeah. But, but presumably to the extent somebody's saying, what have you discussed, you know, what has the, you know, what has the resource group discussed or what is the resource group planning to discuss at the meeting you've got scheduled in a couple of weeks' time? That's all transparent to the public. Yeah. Yes, I mean, we, we got the stuff up on the website, yes. I, I think probably not that long after it was actually yeah. sent to the, yeah. to the committee. Yeah. And that's the intention going yeah. forward. <clears throat> I was going to say in summing up that, you know, we've had a good day and I think a good discussion, but this is our first hurdle. We've got over that. There's a lot of things that we still have to work out exactly how they fall into place and how we report them how we you know take things on board and we'll we'll work through that as we go but i think we successfully discussed i think four <coughs> reasonably good issues and uh, had a good discussion we'll try and work out what our conclusion if any is out of those discussions um and, and we take this final point that we've got to continue to be um, completely transparent and open with what's going on and this isn't a secret society. <laughs> Everything we do, I think, will be on the public record. So um, hopefully we'll keep these people happy and uh, keep your clients and associates happy. Jim, did you want to say anything to finish up? I agree with you, Ian. I think it was a good discussion, and I think the, the range of issues were, you know, these were the right types of issues uh, to be bringing forward and ranged from, I, I think, since Scott, you'd, observed this at the break, ranged from maybe a potential issue that people said wasn't clear in the drafting to, you know, a pre-existing issue in how people apply the standard of, of revenue recognition today and maybe an, an issue where the, the change is causing uncertainty in practice, so the right range of issues. And, and I think each of the participants both here and, and in London for your willingness to participate today and participate going forward. Good. Well, thank you very much, and I think with that, we'll call the meeting to a close. Thank you.